like to call the select board to order for today's meeting for May 21st, 2019. It's nice to have people in the audience. Hello. Um, all right, we're going to take things just a little bit out of order in order to um, have the proclamation for General Jack Hammond. So, John, I will turn it over to you. Okay. Well, we, we, we do have a proclamation, which I'm going to read in just a second for uh, the board's vote. But I just do want to comment on the fact that we have a native son who's going to be uh, delivering the Memorial Day address, and we wanted to honor him. Um, that would be Brigadier General Jack Hammond. Um, interestingly, you know, we could spend a whole meeting talking about Jack Hammond and his, you know, his accomplishments. But he spent 30 years um, serving his country. He is um, the first. Massachusetts serviceman since World War II to achieve the rank of general. Um, his list of accomplishments and awards um, are long as you are. Um, and it's very interesting that after those kinds of responsibilities and, um, and what he did, you know, during his time in the military, you know, serving in major command positions both in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, as he exited the military, kind of continues his public service um, at home base, which is very interesting. Um, I took the opportunity to, um, he delivered what I thought was a very special um, Veterans Day address a couple of years ago. Uh, it's actually been published and reprinted and it's really, I think we got, we're in for a, a real treat when we hear from him on Memorial Day. Um, and you know, it's interesting, his, um, his nonprofit home base, which services um, um, veterans and their families um, in cooperation with the Red Sox Foundation and uh, Mass General Hospital uh, has a, they have a motto. Uh, the mission's, com their mission is complete, ours has just begun. And that seems to be what the general's all about. So I want to read a uh, certificate of appreciation um, to be presented to Brigadier General Jack Hammond. Uh, this will be on the occasion of his address on Memorial Day. In appreciation for your participation in Reading's 2019 Memorial Day services and in recognition of your decorated military career and continued outstanding leadership with home base to heal the invisible wounds for veterans, service members, and their families, you have done Reading proud. Given this 27th day of May 2019 by the Reading Select Board, and that would be signed by all of us, and uh, we need to have a I, I move that we accept this proclamation. We need to vote for that. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to ask Kevin if you would uh, take custody of this. Uh, Absolutely. We're actually going to hand to Caitlin Marsh still wants to sign. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, so we'll, we'll do the exchange later in the week. Got it. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, so Thanks for being here tonight. Well, I realize we don't have the microphones for RCTV. Is this new? Uh, I don't know. There are overhead microphones. Maybe we we'll switch to those. Do you mind just checking? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Okay. Uh, so we're all set, guys. I was using the other microphones for the board of health. Awesome. Thank you. We're live. We're live. Everything's all set. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. So uh, before we go into remote reports and comments, I wanted to just give a run through of the agenda and what we can expect tonight. Um, we'll be hearing from the town treasurer regarding borrowing from the MWRA. Uh, the board will be voting on this issue. Then we'll be hearing about the Heartbeat Festival, also known as Jam, uh, Gems for Jake. Mm -hmm. Then we'll have the firefighter pinning. Chief Burns will be joining us. Um, at 8 p.m., we're going to have a classification and compensation hearing, and the board will be voting on that. We'll be having the Board of Health will be joining us to discuss pesticide policy uh, regarding tree lawns. Um, there will not be a vote at that time. It's just it's a preliminary discussion. Um, we'll then move on to discussing the select board onboarding manual, potential charter change for uh, having non-residents as members of board committees and commissions. This is a preliminary discussion as well. There will be no vote. We'll have an update on select board goals, a discussion on office hours and locations for the select board, and then future agenda discussion and minute approval. So, uh, for everyone who has taken a look at our new packet, I want to thank Caitlin for a new fabulous format that we have. It is much easier to read, so thank you, Caitlin, for taking the initiative on that. Um, and we will go to liaison reports. 
Andy, do you have anything today? Do. Well, first of all, after our new liaisons were signed, I was out of, I've been out of town, so I haven't been able to any means. But I wanted to highlight uh, two things. Um, first, the Board of Health, it's some, some exciting news, I think. The Board of Health is, is going to look into um, uh, nicotine addiction uh, regarding, uh, or in as associated with, rather, um, vaping. Um, especially, and this is you know a big concern in schools, etc. And um, they're indicating that they want to reach out to Arcasa and work with Arcasa, which um, you know is pretty exciting given the, given the level of concern that this has caused in our schools. So that's a that's a positive note. The other positive note is that um, this Thursday. Um, I wanted to mention that there's a, a pulse of reading happening in the library, um, and and you can read about it on their website. But basically, it's a there are community conversations to sort of try to understand um, what what the changes and transitions we're going through uh, mean for us both individually and in the community. So it's a great chance to have your voice be heard. And that's next Thursday. I think it's a week from this Thursday. That is May 30th. Yeah. Can I say this? It's uh, 7 p.m. The library? Yeah. yeah, yeah, May 30th. Did I say this Thursday? You did. I'm tired. <laughs> Um, so I did include a couple of updates uh, for the packet. The Board of Library Trustees met last Monday. Um, I was not in attendance at the meeting, but I did uh, catch up with one of the members afterwards. Um, one, um, one, uh, one item of note is that there will be an upcoming retirement reception to be held Tuesday, uh, May 28th from 3 to 5 p.m. to celebrate uh, the upcoming retirement of Corinne Fisher, Reading Public Library Head of Children's Services, and Brenda Wettergreen, um, Children's Librarian. Um, they'll meet again on Monday, June 10th. Um, there are two Zoning Board of Appeals meetings tomorrow night, both in Wakefield regarding uh, the continued hearing on Tarrant Lane, and also uh, here in Reading, a Reading Zoning Board of Appeals hearing, which I plan, which I plan to attend. Um, and I believe, Andy, have we confirmed that the the ad hoc committee on on the human rights working group will that will we be meeting ne next week? Likely, most likely. likely. Okay. I haven't checked the latest okay. Google poll results. Okay, but so that's we will be moving. So I think if 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 individuals in town are interested in that, um, we'll make sure that that gets posted. Um, it's po it's very likely to be next week. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> John. I've been on a world tour for two weeks since our last meeting. I've been in town actually for one day, so I don't have anything to update at this time. And something new that we're trying now is everyone is, uh, the board members are submitting um, their liaison reports in writing and we're including them in the packet. And so what's happening um, in the meetings itself will be a little briefer than what people are used to, but feel free to take a look at the packet for that. Um, we're going to have the town manager's report followed by public comment. Bob? Okay, thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Matt Cornelis. Uh, while I was away this weekend doing my worldwide tour of college graduation, mm -hmm. um, uh, he attended a very successful plant and bake sale from the Garden Club right out on the Common, and also the Police Open House. So congratulations to both those groups. Um, I wanted to make sure the board was aware uh, that the town clerk did receive a letter of resignation from one of the Board of Cemetery Trustees members. They had been in question as to whether you might need to hold a hearing. You won't have to. It's all set. Thank you, John. Um, May 23rd, this Thursday, there's a volunteer appreciation dinner at 5 o'clock at the Pleasant Street Center. Um, the proclamation earlier has um, highlighted the fact that there's a very nice program already out for Memorial Day. Thanks to Ann and Vanessa for speaking. Um, especially for Vanessa and John, but others, uh, please let me know if you're interested. On June 27th at the school committee uh, meeting, they will discuss and update some of the capital projects. So if a third member plans to attend, or three or more, we do want to post you. Um, that will be, um, you know, especially on the um, enrollment study and turf two. And then the building security may get a small update. Why don't we go ahead and post for that just okay, in case yeah. I know I'm I'll be in attendance. I'm attending yeah, to go. Let's just cover okay, ourselves thank in. You. 
Do you know what time that's going to be? Um, the meeting starts at 7. I'm not sure what time that agenda. Normally they do that early on, so I'll let you know. Great. Thank you. Oh, it's at 7 o'clock. Um, yeah, and normally they would do an update like that on the early side. The superintendent's conference room? Uh, Scatini Library. Oh, Scatini Library. Uh, I'm gathering feedback from the various boards and committees that you appoint uh, as, as they see your role as liaison, so I'll uh, circulate that in your next packet. It's interesting. Uh, even within a department, um, the answers are quite different as to what they see, so I think it'll be helpful for you mm -hmm. to start a two-way discussion with some of the boards and committees. Um, in your packet was, uh, I guess, pages 10 to 21, chapter 61, land. Um, as I mentioned, I'm not going to get into the great deal tonight. Um, the town has a right of first review, refusal for 120 days, which runs us through August. Um, I learned subsequent to writing a memo to you that CONSCOM may well take a position and vote on this, but they have not done so yet. Uh, if they do, it will be to encourage you to acquire the parcel. Um, the land is 27,000 square feet. The price tag is $400,000. Um, I have talked to Town Council DeRay, and if we, uh, if the board is interested in going down this route, we'll have to find another council because he has no in-house expertise at Chapter 61 land, but he'll help us find someone. Um, so I'd prefer if you know we can put that on a future agenda when all five of you will be here, uh, just to see if we need to hire outside council because that'd take a little while. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of funding, I. I don't know, but we might potentially need a special town meeting in order to fund that. It depends on the purchase of sale, whether it could be delayed to November, I don't. What's the timing on that? Um, the board has to make a decision by some time in August, and so you have four or five meetings between now and then. Uh, and last but certainly not least, um, we've hired an economic development director and parenthetically a community development director. Um, each are working this week for other employers, so I don't want to get into a great deal of detail. Uh, but if everything goes to plan, plan, they will both visit you uh, probably at your second meeting in June. Um, and uh, when you see more details, you'll know that I couldn't be any happier. It's worked out very, very well, knock on wood. That's all I have. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to public comment now. Oh. Uh, Vanessa, could I just ask, um, Bob, I think you, you've updated me by email but because I asked um, at our last meeting if you could update Haverhill. the public about um, um, about Haverhill, Haverhill Street. Street yes yeah we're meeting tomorrow uh, the PTTTTTTF group is meeting tomorrow <laughs> um, I'm not sure that might be one too many T's <laughs> Um, it's a very complicated situation, and, and I'm not going to go into a great detail other than say that um, MassDOT has found a document that was pre-charter signed by a then Board of Selectmen that has co complicated things. It was from the 1970s. So Town Council is looking at it, looking at the process, um, and we're just going to have to work together to see, and it, and it may well affect more than just Haverhill Street. Mm -hmm. So it calls into question some of the things that Reading has done potentially. Um, so I really don't know the answer other than we will have a report for you in June, hopefully the first meeting, but I'm not certain it'll be the first meeting. Um, it did turn out to be a, a much more complicated research project than any of us had imagined. Um, because that document, no one in this institution knew about that document. Someone found it at MassDOT just last week or 10 days ago and sent us a copy and sure enough it was signed by the then Reading Board of Selectmen. So, um, you know, we'll give you an update as soon as we have one. Um, Bob's comment about graduation uh, re reminded me to let people know that, that uh, Mark Doxer's not here tonight for, for because of graduation. So, uh, yeah. All right. Any other questions for Bob? Okay. Uh, so, some guidelines for public comment. If you're here to speak, um, I would ask that you could kindly <coughs> keep the comments um, to topics that are under the board's purview. Um, there will be no derogatory comments will be accepted, no election campaign related comments. Um, kindly ask if you can keep comments to two minutes. Um, please note that due to open meeting law, which is a state law, we're not actually able to engage with you on your comment. We can provide information. The town manager might be able to engage. Um, if you have ongoing concerns, we'd be happy to either put you on a future agenda or engage offline as appropriate. Um, and the last item is please state your name and address. So, hands for public comment. 
Yes, Mr. Brown. Thank you. Bill Brown, uh, 28 Mountain Road. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Uh, the gentleman who just gave the proclamation to uh, at the Parker Junior High School one day. Um, I was also a graduate of Parker Junior High School and told I could speak to the kids, but I got outranked by a colonel and a light bird, so I didn't <laughs> get an opportunity to speak. So it's, well, with, well, it's, with three stripes, you don't get to fight a general. That's fair. Other public comment? Huh? Other public comment? Um, next, we will hand it over to Andrew for the MWRA borrowing. Yep. Thank you. Um, can we come? Yeah, come on up. Here's the hot seat. So, um, I am the town engineer is here. If you have questions related to the actual projects, uh, in terms of the borrowing, it's going to be uh, two hundred and sixty thousand dollars over ten years, and this is an MWRA, which is interest-free loan. So um, I wish all of the borrowing was industry, but <laughs> the rest of it, it's a grant, so uh, we don't pay for it. But if you, this is phase, I believe it's phase 11, um, and if you have any specific question for the project, um, Ryan is here and he can assist you. So, Bob, do we have a motion on this? Uh, John does. It may take a few minutes. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> yeah. can we, uh, before you start, can someone please remind me what the motion is to bypass all of that? Uh, dispense with the further reading. Thank you. Go right ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, as the acting clerk of the Select Board of the Town of Reading, Massachusetts, certify that a meeting of, of the board held May 21st, 2019, of which meeting all members of the board were duly notified and at which a quorum was present. The following votes were unanimously passed, all of which appear upon the official record of the board in my custody. I voted that the sale of the $260,000 sewer bond of the town dated June 3rd, 2019 to Massachusetts Water Resource Authority. The authority is hereby approved and the town treasurer or other appropriate town official is authorized to execute on behalf of the town a loan agreement and a financial assistance agreement with the authority with respect to the bond. The bond shall be payable without interest on May 15th of the years and in the principal amounts as follows. This is the place you could probably say that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 2020. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Okay, I'm going to be signing off and we're going to be borrowing $260,000. I have lots of signatures for you. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Okay. You're doing a great job, John. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we're we're I get a raise for this, right? <laughs> um, next up, we will be hearing from Kelsey Timonelli and Brittany Wilson to tell us about the Beat Heart Festival. Uh, a little uh, amendment to that. We'll be hearing from John, John Oliver and Lauren Oliver. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Uh, so we just have a few words about our upcoming event. Um, good evening. My name is John Oliver. This is my wife, Lauren. I am the president, and Lauren is the vice president of the nonprofit, the Beat Heart Foundation. At this point, I hope that name is a little familiar. Um, in just a month from now, on June 22nd, we'll be holding our third annual Jams for Jake Festival. We have made what we think is a huge upgrade in location. We were at Simon's Field for the past two years, uh, but now we will be at the Birch Meadow Field directly across from Coolidge Middle School. We have done a lot of work becoming more familiar with the youth and students of the Reading community. And since last year's festival, we've, ha we've had two successful events which kind of bol bolstered our brand. One was a Halloween-themed coffee house at Parker Middle, oh no, that was at Birch Meadow Elementary School. And the second was a Narcan education and demonstration seminar, and that was at Parker Middle School. We are beginning to notice recognition in the town with young adults and families, which is highly encouraging to us. Our whole purpose is to celebrate music and creative talent while opening up the network of substance abuse and treatment by breaking down the stigma and bringing recovery sources to fun and community-based events that we host. Uh, Jams for Jake is our premier event, and this year we expect our impact to be greater than ever. At the improved Birch Meadow Field location, there will be food trucks, ample parking, fun outdoor activities, a new marketplace featuring local businesses, and of course, plenty of great local art and music. We envision friends in the community gathering together to reflect on the hardships our community has experienced due to substance abuse, while exploring coping mechanisms and recovery strategies in a supportive atmosphere. There will be several recovery groups present, including Learn to Cope, 
Healthy Streets Right Turn and our own ARCASA that will be available to chat and increase exposure to their vital life-saving services. We are also very proud to announce another modest but meaningful goal. Through donations made at Jams for Jake this year and in the following years, we intend to create a perpetual scholarship through the Reading Scholarship Foundation in honor of our late friend Jake Suzwa. Next Wednesday, we will present the first one-time $500 scholarship to a community service-minded RMHS senior pursuing art, music, or counseling in their undergraduate degree. Uh, in the weeks between now and June 22nd, if you go to see any movies at the Woburn uh, Showcase Cinema, you'll see one of our outreach tools, which is a promotional advertisement, which has a lot of footage from last year's event. And it does a great job at conveying how much fun uh, Chancellor Jake is for kids and adults and families. Uh, we will also be installing a wooden hope and memorial tree in the center of town um, where members of the community can hang a leaf in memory of a loved one or in solidarity with a loved one or stranger in recovery. Uh, we just had a DRT meeting about that last, last week, week yeah. which I think went well. Um, we expect roughly between 300 and 500 attendees. Last year we hit about 250. Um, so we're trying to get a little bit more this year. With location and the, 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 the outreach helps. Um, all age groups are, are expected and definitely welcome. It's a free event, and again, it is on Saturday, June 22nd. It will start at 12 and will go to around 6 p.m. Um, I open to any questions for the board or anybody um, in the audience about our event at this point. I um, don't have a question, but I do have a comment. Um, I, I just think and I want to say this on my own behalf and as a member of our CASA, and I, and I think I speak for the rest of the board, what, what you folks have done is really one of the most powerful things that we've seen in recent memory here. You know, you, the loss of your friend um, created a, an obvious and, and instinctive you know, call to action. Um, you know, you're reaching into his love of music and turning that into something that um, gives some meaning to that tragedy in a, in a very positive way. And um, I just want to say to you that um, I, I just think that what you're doing is so very special, so very meaningful. Um, you know, when you lose someone, everybody reacts and wants to, you know, memorialize them and you know, say nice things and mourn the loss. but. Um, you and the group of people that you've associated yourself with in this board of directors, this foundation emerged from the first uh, Jams for Jakes, right? I mean, yeah. isn't that yeah. kind of how this thing unfolded? Yeah, we, we needed a bank account. <laughs> yeah, we needed a bank account. So, okay, so we do a foundation and, you know, and then it, but, it, but it's gotten so much bigger so much more quickly and it, it's, we have a lot of, all of us have a lot of problems that we face. This is probably the, the biggest problem that we face in this town. As you well know, um, we've lost just so many people in this town, particularly young people. Um, and I think the, the approach that you've taken here to bring the awareness around and, you know, kind of turn it into a discussion, turn it into a dialogue, I, that just, you know, I, I'm so... I'm so um, encouraged, and I think all of us are, when we're able to see what you started just a couple of short years ago um, and watch what's emerged in that website and that foundation and scholarships for the, you know, for students who are pursuing positive energy things, those things that your friend Jake, you know, really cared about. I mean, it's interesting because um, it personally, um, I, I look at all the names, Jake's included, and I remember, you know, registering him for Little, you know, many years ago, and then you kind of see the tragedy of some of these things happen, but then you see out of that tragedy people like yourselves stepping forward. So I, I you know, on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you very much for what you're doing, and um, we're certainly going to, you guys seem to bring the rain out on these days. We're yeah, we're trying to go for a sunny day on, on the first Third time's a charm. Yeah, that's what we're hoping for. So. Thank you very much Thank for you. being here and for what you're doing and what we know you're going to continue to do on behalf of our town. Yeah, we appreciate you saying that. I Thank think you. Um, you really, I'm glad that you are picking up on everything we're trying to convey. That really means a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming and for everything that you're doing. Thank Thanks. you.
Uh, I, I, if we could just repeat, that's on June 22nd. June 22nd. Yes, so Saturday, June 22nd. Sorry, uh, 12 to 6, and the rain date's just the next day. So, it, God forbid, it will be on Sunday. And it's at Birch Meadow. Birch Meadow. Okay. The stage will be where the um, Imagination Station lot is, and then the audience will be on the grass. Next time. I think John spoke for all of us. So, yes. thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, next up, we're going to have uh, the Reading 375th celebration update. And I need to step out for just a moment, Gene, so apologies. But should be I'm in big trouble. It's the first time I haven't had my button on. <laughs> <laughs> and look at this. This is just your yeah. signature in all of these. Oh, everyone's got the fever. Do you want us to wait or do you? Yeah. Uh, I think you can go ahead. Okay. All right. I think she's had to go ahead. To wait? Well, we'll start with, uh, we have an updated flyer, we can pass this out. This now has the times on it, and, uh, and the venues. Awesome. And uh, do you want to talk a little bit about opening? Yeah, absolutely. So we were delighted to be invited back here to speak. Um, kind of didn't anticipate speaking again. Um, but we're delighted at the enthusiasm and support from the board, so we're very grateful to be here. Instead of going through every single um, list of the event, which I did last time, um, because now you're all fully aware and fully engaged with it, we did think we would highlight a couple of events that we have a little more detail and context around now. Um, so I'm going to start with opening night, which is a week from Friday. The level of enthusiasm is very high. Um, we're going to have a Jumbotron. It starts at 7 p.m. on the Common. There's going to be a huge Jumbotron that will feature a um, original video production showing Reading um, anniversary celebrations historically. So the last one was 25 years ago in 1994 and back into All the... All the way back to 1844. Yeah, so some really beautiful historic images of how this town has celebrated its anniversary going back well more than 100 years, which I think sets the, the context for this celebration. We're, we're mo this is our, our moment in history in Reading, and so it sets a context really beautifully. There's going to be live music. It's going to be fairly brief, um, 20, 30 minutes? About 20, yeah, 25 minutes or so, yeah. It could be a, f a few speeches and some uh, an illumination of the common, and then a couple of surprises. Yeah, a couple of surprises that we have very intentionally decided to keep for the people who show up that night. There's going to be some fun surprises. Um, but live music, there'll be an illumination of the common. Um, it's really intended to kick off the celebration. After that... Um, downtown Reading will be open. We've had a tremendous response from local churches, organizations, and businesses and restaurants um, to participate in opening night. We've decided to hang, um, to post purple balloons at all participating venues, so you could just walk down the street and see where there are activities. But of course, we'll also post the venues on the website. There'll be handouts that night. The public will have a, a variety of ways to find out what is happening where. But to just give you um, a taste, at the Old South Church, there's going to be contra dancing. Um, at the Congregational Church, there will be an ice cream social with ice cream generously donated from Dandelions. Um, First Baptist Church is putting together a Make Your Own S'mores event. Um, at the Church of the Good Shepherd, there's going to be an organ demonstration and some special music every half an hour, so there'll be a musical presentation there. The Northeast School of Ballet is doing dance demonstrations till 8.30 p.m. Pomplamous is hosting a wine tasting. Tin Bucket has music by CB Tween, and 10% off your entire purchase if you're wearing your Reading 375 gear. Um, oh, main... Um, 565 um, is actually going to have a booth on the common. You don't have to go to the hair studio. And they're going to be doing purple hair extension, <coughs> purple hair chalking for people who really want to get into the spirit of writing 375. I, 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 what do you think? Oh. <laughs> I'm definitely getting one. Absolutely. Um, Venetian Moon um, is doing a special Reading Martini flight. Your Martini flight will come with three trivia questions about the town of Reading. If you answer them correctly, you get 10% off your food purchase. Bun Raddies is also offering 10% off your um, meal if you're wearing a Reading 375 button or um, T-shirt. Cafe Nero is offering triple stamps on your loyalty card. So if, like, be your regular Nero customer, you're going to get that free latte a lot quicker. Music Street is performing on the Common. Um, Whitelum Books is hosting two author story times. So if you have little children with you, they're doing one before the event on the common and one after. So you can bring your kids to a wonderful story event at Whitelum Books. Um, Fitness Within is offering a boot camp promotion. That's really cool. The details will be on the website. And Hote Seconds Consignment Shop is offering 20% off the entire store, 50% off winter items. So if you're in the mood to shop, 
that will be your opportunity. Um, so we've really tried to find something for everyone, small children, um, families, singles, everybody will find something that night that will be entertaining and fun and a real celebration downtown. Thank you, Madam. All right, yeah. good. Sounds like the 375th may have already started. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I forgot. I did have one more thing. Also kicking off on May 31st for Reading 375 is Roaming Reading. It is an app-based scavenger hunt sponsored by the Reading Cooperative Bank. It's predominantly sort of taking selfies at various venues around town. So if you're anticipating going to a lot of these events anyway, it's kind of a fun way to participate. You can see how you're doing relative to other people in town. Um, it's, it's really going to be a fun event. And the Reading Cooperative Bank has also um, put up $1,500 in prizes um, as well for people um, who win very Categories. All sorts of categories. Yeah, all best, sorts of creative best dog categories. photo, best family photo. Or <laughs> yeah, it's really going to be a fun way to participate, so I'm excited about that. Yeah. But you want to download, I should say that, you want to download that app. You can do that today. I actually already downloaded it myself. Um, the details are on the website. The game starts on May 31st, so you want to have it downloaded and like on May 31st, get in there, log in, and start playing. Another event that we did not have any details on the last time we were here is Charter Day. We're going to have an event. The uh, residents at Pearl Street has graciously offered to host this. You know, we're calling it Reading Speaks. We, it's a, I guess I'd call it an oral timeline. We have speeches, poems, uh, quotes from 1630 all the way up to 2019. And we're going to have various people in town get up and give some of those talks. Uh, the whole, we're also going to have some music in between, theme music that will go with it. Uh, we may have some uh, uh, visiting dignitaries, we're still working on that. that. That will take roughly 35 to 40 minutes and after that we'll have a giant birthday cake. We did promise cake. We did promise cake. <laughs> Another thing that we, I don't know if you would uh, talked about the concert, the concert for Reading. Mm -mm. You did that. Okay, the yeah, last time. Uh, concert for Reading is on uh, Saturday, June 1st. It's a combination of both the Reading Symphony Orchestra, 86 year old orchestra, along with the Reading Community Singers, who are celebrating their centennial this year. In addition to those two groups, there's also uh, four or five <coughs> smaller um, musical organizations that have some connection to the high school. Tickets are free, but you need a ticket. You can get them at three locations right now, RCTV Studios, right here at Town Hall, or at Whiteland Books. And there may be more uh, locations if we can get them signed up. Uh, Porch Fest, uh, just to give you an update on that, we now are sitting at 35 musical acts that will be all over town in people's porches, front lawns, driveways. We've got all sorts of uh, genres. We've got rock, folk, country. Uh, banjo, punk, a cappella. We're looking for bagpipes. Anybody play the bagpipes? And <laughs> yeah, that's coming along nicely. That's, um, that's still counting. I think we'll probably get a few more before we close it out. And another one I don't think you talked about too much. This is uh, Marcel Dubois' uh, uh, project, A Dog Parade. This will be on Saturday, June 15th in a, in a lull period at the Birch Meadow. We'll have a dog parade, and that's going to be at the Wood End School and then into the town forest. He's hoping to get 375 dogs. We'll see. <laughs> 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 you got to right, have a fire. Just host the talk. I'll <laughs> jump on that. The only thing I'll say about the dog parade is the registration is required. So you do have to go on the website and register to just... And obviously dogs have to be registered. ...attest that your dog's uh, yep. had its rabies vaccine yep. and so forth. Um, so if this house could talk, when I last year I described this event to you, but to remind anybody, um, how this works is you go to writing375.com, you sign up under if this house can talk, you give your name, your address, your email address, and that's pretty much it. You are registered. Um, we will get to you, and we're now delivering uh, as a new service from Reading 375. We will deliver to your home, if you like, um, your own If This House Can Talk. They're custom-made signs, so they'll be consistent through the town for the two-week event. And you just type up a short blurb about your home, or in some cases, we have some local businesses participating, which is really cool. Some of our business buildings have great history. Um, just something about your house that's interesting or important to you. You post it on the sign. You put it in your lawn on the 31st. It's stays there through the 15th, and as people are enjoying Porch Fest or other events through the town, they're going to see these signs, stop and read about your home, and we will have the opportunity to hear our neighbors' stories, which is really lovely. Um, when I was here last time, I think I told you that we had between 40 and 50 participants. We're up to over 70 right now. In the last two weeks, there's been real momentum around this. Um, I was actually at the garden event, 
And I can't believe how many people said, oh, these signs, I want one of these. So we were kind of handing them out. Um, there's a lot of momentum around this, so it's going to be a great event. Um, and it is not too late. If any of you or anyone in the public want to participate in it, this house can talk. It's as easy as going on the website. Similarly, um, when I was here last time, I talked a little bit about Paint the Town, the town-wide art show that's happening over the two-week period. We have two updates on that. When I was here last time, I think I told you we had more than 30 works of art. We're up to 40. 40 original works of art created by local artists, all inspired by our town. It's really quite an amazing um, response to this event. And the new update is we now have the venues that these artworks will be um, will be displayed at during the two-week event. They're on the website, writing375.com. Click on Paint the Town. You can see all the venues. Um, there are 12 venues, I believe, 40 submissions of art. And um, there's a really nice balance between public buildings. Town Hall is a venue. The Senior Center is a venue. The Public Library is a venue. So are a lot of our local businesses. And I think the idea is that as you are going about your life during that two-week period, you're going to be hit by these works of art and be aware that that has happened and hopefully be inspired. So we're really excited about the, the response to that. I think that's probably it for the new I new think subjects. That's I don't know if you have any questions it? about some of the ones that we presented in the past, or what these new ones. Yeah, I do. Um, not a question, but a comment. I mean, after Gene was here last time, we kind of exchanged some, you know, back and forth emails and, you know, Jean's enthusiasm is, you know, spectacular. She's been all over town for, you know, weeks and months actually promoting this. And um, I, I stole your email that you shared with me. Um, Jean shared an email with me that she was using in her email address book. Um, and so I, you know, I piggybacked on it with her permission and really have gotten a lot of positive response. And I would say to you, now that you've got if this can come electronically, then you know for us to be able to circulate this with our email address books, I think is going to be. Yeah, I got a copy to so, I, so I just want to say, I thanks. I'm sorry about the button. Honest to God, no. religiously, but uh, uh, ran out of the house without mine tonight. But well, thank you so but, much. But share this with us electronically. Yes, yeah, and send it to the town. We'll, you know, circulate it. And we'll get it posted on the website, of course. Thank you for that. And if you did not get an email from me, it literally means I don't have your email address. If I know you in Reading and I have your email address, you got that email. So thank you. And the board has, has really stepped up. Thank you, Mr. Halsey, for spreading the word. Um, and speaking of gratitude, I do want to acknowledge that um, the school department's been phenomenal at putting up social media posts, email blasts to educate the parent community. Obviously, a lot of these events, I mean, there's a symphony concert that's free. As a parent with children, that's an amazing opportunity. The art show, there's so, the scavenger hunt, there's so many fun things that are free to the public that are great for parents. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that the town and the police department have really done both in terms of um, public relations and helping us get the word out, but also in terms of logistics. They know their way around complex events and have been helpful in kind of sorting through, did you think of this, did you think of this, and have really been partners. So we're really grateful for the support. Hey, thank, thank, you thank you for coming for our meeting. Oh, oh. If I could just put in a positive word also for Images of Reading, of America Reading. Um, Everett and Ginny Blodgett have written a new book. Um, I was the fortunate recipient uh, of three of them last week for my family. Um, and I couldn't put it down. I, I got it in the morning from Everett. I started reading and um, you know, I had to dock myself some pay because it was just, I couldn't put it down. It was just such a, such a good book and so well written. Mm -hmm. Not just interesting pictures, but really thoughtful the way it was written. So I couldn't speak more highly. And I know that also the uh, 350th book is also available. Yes. Gene, as a reminder, where are those books available? Should people be interested in purchasing them? Uh, right now, I think they're only available through Everett Gene. And then I think his, his, well. his email address for now. Yes. So it's on the 375th website. And it should be noted that um, the proceeds from that book are going to benefit Reading 375, the conservation of some local historic artifacts that they have certainly identified as being worthy of conservation, and also the Friends of Parker Tavern, the Antiquarian Society. So they not only is it an amazing book, and I agree with you, I have my own copy, it's fantastic, um, but they're very generously giving back to the community through proceeds. Yeah, true. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. And thank you to you and all the volunteers. Do you want to take two minutes and I'll get the firefighters? Um, we're going to just take a two minute break before we do the Show firefighter the badge pinning and recognition so we can let everybody in.
These are um, these are linked by year. Yep. Yep. And um, the uh, so um, so. Uh, Thank you all for coming here. Thank you. All right. Um, we're going to have the firefighter badge pinning and recognition. Thank you all for being here, and I will hand it over to Chief Burns. Okay. Well, thank you all for having us uh, tonight. A kind of a uh, disruption a little bit as we got organized here. But uh, we're here for two reasons tonight. One is to give uh, service awards to firefighters who have been here for more than 20 years. Uh, 1999, the Massachusetts Fire Service Commission uh, started a program to recognize firefighters in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for the years of service for 20 years and above in five-year increments. So tonight we have a lot of experienced people here tonight. It's, it's, it's nice recognition for them. Um, and uh, tonight I'd like to start with the Assistant Chief, uh, Paul Jackson. He's currently in his 36th year with the Reading Fire Department. He started when he was 11. <laughs> he started in uh, January of 1980. Like <laughs> <laughs> he became a lieutenant in 1990, an assistant chief in uh, 2016. And I'd like to say thank you very much for your years of service and also support to me. And here's your 35 year pin. Yeah, thank you. And next we have Captain Peter Marchetti. Peter has been with us for 33 years. 33 years. He began in January of 1986. He became a lieutenant in 1992. Captain in 2005. He's got a master's degree in fire science. Also, he's an EMT. And I'd just like to say thank you all for, for what you do for us. Thank, thank you, you, Captain. Next we have uh, Captain Mark Dwyer. Mark is in his 31st year with the Reading Fire Department. He started in August of 88, became a lieutenant in 2004, a captain in 2016. Mark has two master's degrees, one in uh, business, business administration, master's in business administration, and the second in uh, fire science. I'd like to say thank you, Captain. Thank you for your years of service. <laughs> Next we have uh, firefighter Pat Wallace. He's one of our senior firefighters. He's been with us for 31 years. Pat was paramedic, also uh, an EMT. He's been with us since August of 1988, and he's, he's one, of our, one of our top firefighters. Thank you very much. Next, we have uh, firefighter Bob Beck. Bob's been with us for 1988 again. Uh, no, 91. 1991. <laughs> well, I'll take 88. I'll take 88. More vacation time. Wow. Yeah. You heard it here. This is a great meeting. <laughs> Bob's been with us since 1991. Bob's been very in involved in a lot of things in the Reading Fire Department. He's currently our union president. He's been involved with the union in a lot of different levels uh, for, for many years. Bob's also very involved in uh, community CPR and also uh, in the Toys for Tots program. So Bob does a tremendous amount of work each year in the Toys for Tots program. So thank you, Bob, for all that. And next up we have uh, firefighter David Robodeau. Uh, David has been with us since uh, August of 1994. 
He's, he's another one of our top senior firefighters. He's in his 25th year of service. So I'd like to say thank you very much, David, for all your years of service. Next, next we have Lieutenant Delsey Nori. Oh, that's right. <laughs> 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 Lieutenant Delsey Nori is currently in his 25th year of service. He began in 1994 and was promoted to lieutenant in July of 2016. So, Tony has also been very involved in the union over the years. He's been union president and for uh, a number of different times, a number of different uh, years in office. So, I'd like to thank you very much for your support, Tony. Next, I will. I will. But well, we haven't. A number of other firefighters that, that received the awards that they just weren't able to make it here tonight. Uh, we also have a, a, a nice event. We have five new firefighters who would like to introduce awesome. to you tonight. Can I just do this? Tony, would you go this way and bring the recruits this way, please? Sure. Um, step down? Sure. Thank you. Let's go right there. Yep. Yeah. So, um, is there anything you have? Uh, okay. So um, tonight I'd like to introduce to you uh, firefighter uh, Danny Ruiz. Uh, he began working for us on January, January 2nd of, of this year, and we promptly sent him to the Boston Fire Academy on January 2nd. Danny uh, completed uh, three months of training, finished up in late April, and he's certified firefighter one and two. Uh, Danny attended the Mount Ida College and earned a paralegal certificate. In 2006, he became an EMT and went to work for Boston EMS for two years. Uh, and then he moved on to Atlantic Ambulance. In 2018, he completed the paramedic training program at ENT's Incorporated and became a licensed paramedic. Uh, and he worked his way up to being a paramedic at Atlantic Ambulance. So we're currently doing the initial training with Danny right now. So proud to have oh, you. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Danny's uh, father is going to pin the badge on him. Chief, put your head step on front. Do it on front. Okay. Yeah. Right in the middle. 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 Right <laughs> a lot easier to get the pictures that way. Uh, why don't you just come right up here? Okay, um, I'd like to introduce uh, to you tonight uh, firefighter Ashley Ould. She actually began working as a Reading firefighter on February 21st of this year. Uh, this Thursday, Ashley begins training at the Massachusetts Firefighting Academy. Um, Ashley became a licensed paramedic in 2016 and has experience working for Atlantic Ambulance. Ashley also has experience working as a call firefighter in the, in the town of Wenham in uh, 2016 and 2017. Prior to her EMS career, Ashley worked as a preschool teacher from 2006 to 2015 and also as a personal trainer. So I'd like to say welcome. Thank you. Proud to have you here. Okay. Who's going to pin your badge? Your son? My son, son, Ryan. Your son Ryan. Yeah. Nicely done. Congratulations. Why you look so nervous? I'm just flushed right now. 
I'd like to introduce you to tonight, Adam O'Doherty. Adam began working uh, as writing firefighter also in February 21st this year. He's also going to attend the academy uh, beginning on Thursday. Uh, in 2016, Adam became an EMT and worked for professional ambulance. And then he became a licensed paramedic in 2017 uh, and worked for professional ambulance. In uh, his prior, prior to becoming an EMT, Adam worked as the in uh, facilities maintenance field and worked his way up to being a supervisor. So he worked in that field from 2009 to 2016. So Adam, proud to have you here. Thank Welcome. You. Who's going to pin your badge? Okay. Yep. 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 <laughs> All right, tonight I'd like to introduce you to Mark Kendi, Mark Kendi Burnett. Burnett. Mark Kendi began working as a Reading firefighter in February 21st this year as well. He's also going to be getting training at the Mass Fire Academy program this Thursday. Uh, and they're scheduled to graduate in August of this year. Mark Kendi worked for Lifeline Ambulance as an EMT from 2013 to 2016. Then he moved to Cataldo Ambulance in 2016. In November, uh, Mark Endy went on uh, to paramedic training program at Northern Essex Community College. And then he moved up to a paramedic position at Cataldo Ambulance. So Mark Endy would like to say welcome. Thank you, Jim. Yep, proud to have you here. And um, Mark Endy's fiance is going to pin the badge on him tonight. He's got a new baby with him tonight. <laughs> I'd like to introduce you tonight, uh, William Madden. Uh, Bill began working as a Reading firefighter also on February 21st, and he will begin uh, training in the Mass Fire Academy on Thursday. And uh, he also worked for Action Ambulance since uh, 2015, first as an EMT, and then in 2018 he completed the paramedic training program at EMT Incorporated, and then he also moved up to be a paramedic with Action Ambulance. So they would like to say welcome. Thank Proud you. to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. And who's going to pin your badge? Wife. Your wife. Bill okay. also has a new baby as well. <laughs> <laughs> and almost two. Right. And almost two year old. Jeez. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so thank you for having us here tonight. It's a nice thing for the families to be able to <laughs> see their, their, um, their loved ones be recognized. And I'd also like to thank the Deputy Chief Clark and Reading Police Officers for coming as well. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So I'd just like to say on behalf of the board, not only welcome to everyone that's new, um, but I think it's really great that the while you're being welcomed and pinned, um, the firefighters are being recognized for their longevity of service. And, you know, um, I think it's especially important that, you know, we've got TV cameras. A lot of people watch this, believe it or not. I mean, <laughs> they watch it for events like this. And, you know, um, for those senior members that were recognized tonight, and all of the first responding team that's here. Um, so many of us owe you such a great debt of gratitude. And it's, we're thrilled that you're able to come and, 
you know, punctuate our otherwise boring lives here with something <laughs> that's kind of interesting, actually, you know. Um, and I can just say personally, as many people in this town can, um, I see some faces in here that um, drag my fat butt right out of the second floor and <laughs> kept me going. Some people aren't real happy that you saved me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we all owe you a great debt of gratitude. And for those of you that are joining, um, you're, you're working with a great team of experienced people. Um, they'll expect a lot. You'll deliver a lot. And this is especially important to me. Um, my grandson just graduated with his fire science and management degree and will be entering the California um, Fire Academy this summer. So um, I'm always especially interested in all of you that work in public safety and now a special interest in uh, those firefighters. So welcome and thank you for everything that all of you do. Um, and thanks for being here tonight and you know, letting your town, your grateful town, see you and acknowledge you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Trying to get a picture with the new guys. I think we put them there. I think we probably. Well, if you stay right there, no one's going to see you. Did we miss them? You know what I think would be good? Why don't we put um, the shorter of the uh, <laughs> of the members of the board in the in the well there? Okay, and we'll kind of flank them. In the big challenge. <laughs> Is there enough room for me? Uh, <laughs> 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 Go ahead. Yeah, go in the middle. That's okay. They can see over you. Don't worry about it. I I could block the sun for God's sake. That's okay. He's kind of with the old fashioned camera. <laughs> My kind of guy. Old yeah. fashioned guy. <laughs> Can you just move ahead just a little bit? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. There you go. There you go. All right, perfect. Thanks. Sorry about that. Appreciate it. Sorry. Right. One more. One more. Oh, one more. Oh, one more. Oh. Gen systems. Gen systems. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Two questions. Sure. Sure. Welcome again to all the Thank mentoring you. programs. Thank you so much. So glad to have you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I just wanted to get my staff to be working tomorrow. Really quick. Yeah, I am working tomorrow. Yeah. Maybe I can get a copy of the sketch. Yes. I'll get that to you. I know. Then I'll be able to get the right spelling. You're welcome. You want to give me a call? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Chief. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you.
with a notice you have to make. No. It is? It's Where the is classification it? compensation one. So, Bob, you're presenting on this, or is it any? Do we have the hearing thing somewhere? Yeah, it's in here. I can give you the packet if you want. Is it in my packet somewhere? It is. Okay. Okay. All right. Next up, we have a hearing to approve the classification and compensation. Um, we just need to find. So. Page 23, did you say? Uh? Yes. Yes, 25 of the PDF. All right, so the process for this will be we're going to have the town, we're going to read the hearing notice. Town manager will present, we'll open the hearing. There will be a brief board discussion, and then there will be a board vote. So I real quickly just want to announce that the Board of Health is in session right now. Thank you. All right, so. Okay, to the inhabitants of the Town of Reading, please take notice that the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Reading will hold a public hearing on May 21st, 2019 at 7.50. We're running a little behind. In the Select Board's meeting room, um, 16 Lowell Street, Massachusetts, to approve the um, FY20 classification and compensation plans. A copy of the proposed document regarding this topic is available in the town manager's office at 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Massachusetts. Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 7.30 to 5.30. Tuesday from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. And we'll be in the board in the select board meeting packet posted at www.readingmass.gov. Um, Thursday, May 16, 2019. All interested parties are invited to attend the hearing or may submit their comments in writing or by mail prior to 6 p.m. on May 21st, 2019 to town manager at ca.reading.ma.us um, by order of Robert W. Lachur, town manager. And I can't read the rest of it. I think you're okay. I think, that's it. I think we got the gist of it. So, Bob. Okay, thank you. Um, typically, at this time of year, after town meetings concluded, the board is asked to vote on two plans. The first one is the classification plan, uh, as John mentioned in the hearing notice. You can see from bold and cross out what changes are suggested. Um, and just to backtrack a slight bit, uh, these changes and the funding, which will be part two, uh, first became public last December at the select board's uh, budget discussions and then carried right through uh, early May uh, town meeting. Um, specifically, the changes on this page um, are to upgrade the permits coordinator by two grades from F to H. The permits coordinator position's job description has changed and was the, this slight difference in pay was funded by the override. Uh, part of the override funding was for building inspections and what the permits coordinator done, has done is take on some of those responsibilities herself uh, to manage all the building inspectors for one thing. Uh, the rest of the changes are in the library. You can see there's a series of things, um, certainly notably is the addition of Librarian 2 and Librarian 1. Um, also in addition of the library communication specialist who has temporarily been on the seasonal chart that the town manager has, but now um, with your approval will be on the full-time chart. Uh, you can see some old job descriptions crossed out um, in, in Class G and then increased to I. Um, what Amy uh, Lannon, who's, who's here as the library director, has done with the trustees and a lot of staff's help was to uh, really look forward to the library of the future. They got settled for a little over a year in their new space with the promise that this is what they would do. They didn't want to do it in advance, which was smart, I think. Um, and their realization is to slim down, if you will, the organization structure and make it a little more streamlined and make it receptive to what a modern library and perhaps a future library will do. So certainly if you have any specific questions, uh, Amy would be happy to answer them. Um, I know from working with Amy, she did an incredibly thorough job. Um, and we'd like to hire her to look at other departments, <laughs> as we've already tried. <laughs> um, that's the classification plan. The compensation plan is part two, as, as John read in the hearing notice. Um, as you can see, it's a series of grades A through M and steps 1 through 13. Um, this year, as was discussed over the winter, uh, this, and this is for non-union, 
we suggested no step increases, just a COLA. Um, that has the uh, advantage, if you will, of increasing the uh, lowest paid range uh, when we need to try to hire. And in addition, uh, folks at the higher steps, um, library is one of the departments where a number of people have been here for a number of years. Typically, step movement is once a year. So again, um, the increase to the whole chart was three and a quarter percent and no step movement, which is equivalent to a one and a quarter percent COLA with a step. So those are the two plans. Uh, they're both effective um, on June 24th, which is the best date for payroll. Uh, and all of this was uh, more than adequately funded in the budgets approved by town meeting. That's it. Any questions? Uh, uh, so we will now open the hearing. Hearing is open. Yes, any public comment regarding compensation? Okay, do I have a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Great, do I have a motion for approval? Move that the board approve the FY20 classification compensation plans as presented. Second. All those in favor? Great. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. All right, so next we're going to move on. We have the Board of Health with us here today. Um, and we're going to have Kevin Sexton, Sexton who's the chair, present some changes, uh, some suggested changes to the pesticide policy for the town. Um, after that, we're going to have a board discussion, including suggested edits or questions. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Next steps will be, um, if the board has significant edits, we can ask the board of health to incorporate our comments and invite them back at a future meeting. Uh, if we're in agreement with the policy, um, any minor edits that we have would go, um, would be incorporated and then town council would need to review and approve. Um, the select board would then vote at a future meeting to incorporate these policy changes. So with that, I'll hand it over to Kevin. Okay. Hey everybody. Um, Kevin Sexton, Chair of the Board of Health. I just want to introduce the board that we have here. Um, Emmy Dove is a Vice Chair. Um, we also have Eleanor Shonkoff as a full voting member. And we have our two Associates members in the back there, um, Heidi Pfeiffer and Lara Romanowski. So, um, I wanted to just take a, a couple of minutes. I know there's probably a lot more questions than anything else uh, that you'll have tonight. So I just want to take a brief overview of how we kind of got here. Tonight in this, uh, what I just passed out to you kind of gives you that, that summary. So this was originally a um, idea brought to us um, from two former members of the Board of Health. And I think it was um, before them was originated from a public comment in regards to pesticides on um, specifically tree lawns. So anywhere from the sidewalk out to the street. Um, this is town owned property, uh, as you all know, and that's what brings us to you tonight. Um, you are the uh, body that governs that, that property. So what essentially we're going to be asking of you is to uh, review this policy that we have uh, drafted and discussed and to see if you are, um, are going to allow us to implement it over that, that specific area that you, um, that you control as the board. So um, the premise behind this was the thought that um, pesticides, obviously, um, as it says in this uh, packet, or excuse me, in this draft, of level one and two are extremely harmful um, in that if we can eliminate them from being used on town property um, and, uh, for the benefit of the public good, then that is exactly what uh, we'd like to try to have happen. So um, the whole background on this was we've, we've discussed it on uh, numerous uh, times, but this is originally a draft from the Marblehead Board of Health. They've had this uh, policy in place for a long, long time now. So we took their policy and drafted and modified it and made it part of our own, what we wanted to use it for. Um, there were a couple of things we, we discussed a lot along the way with regards to it. Most notably, um, with something of this nature, obviously being able to implement and enforce it is a big component to it. Uh, with limited staff availability um, in, um, to be uh, kind of a proactive arm, it makes it very difficult to do. So we're looking to implement this um, based on complaints solely. So this is not something that the town is going to be going out and seeking um, to look to actively find uh, um, businesses or 
residents for. This is something that is complaint driven uh, more than anything else. And we have in, in our section a kind of a, an implementation of how we handle complaints as it, as it comes out built right into the policy. And we really wanted this to be more of an educational uh, policy first and foremost. So one of the biggest modifications we had to Marblehead's original policy was to make sure that the first complaint is something that the, um, would trigger the health agent to then go out and mail our policy to the person that the complaint was lodged against, explaining to them that we do have a new policy here in town. Um, this is, here's the policy itself, here's what is uh, acceptable pesticides, here's what not considered acceptable pesticides to use on just a specific tree lawn section uh, that abuts their property. So we really wanted to make sure that we're not um, jumping to the, to the level of fines just lodged on a first complaint um, from somebody. Um, the letter would though go on to talk about, you know, um, um, after this, if there, um, there could be fines involved if it is proven that you are using uh, illegal pesticides or pesticides that this policy is saying that you do not use. I shouldn't use the term illegal, but um, pesticides that this policy is saying you're not allowed to use on that section of the, um, the tree lawn and sidewalk. So um, the biggest thing I think to take from this is that this isn't talking about private property at all. This is talking specifically um, only to tree lawns and sidewalks, the tree lawn being that small strip of grass in between the sidewalk and the street. Um, I think that's all I have for you right now. I'm sure you have a lot of questions in regards to it. I'm happy to answer those for you, and we are. Okay. Questions from the board? No, I do. Um, so Marblehead's had this in place for about 30 years? Yeah, I remember the health agent. I spoke with him directly. I think they said they rolled it out in the 80s. Yeah, they, I mean, they, I called over there to talk to somebody, and that's what the, the estimate was, that it was over 30 years. Yeah. That they hadn't had a violation, and they hadn't had a fine, even though they have the ability to do that. Um, and I asked him why he thought that was, and he said, well, um, somebody has to tell on somebody or, you know, it does, I mean, it was an interesting conversation. Yep, yeah, same conversation. Yeah. Um, so it makes me wonder, you know, are, are we regulating or creating a policy to create a policy or, I mean, uh, we can't enforce this, correct? Um, I mean, or can we? I'm just, you know, I guess it's enforceable. It's enforceable. It is enforceable. There is, there is a uh, fine component to it. Um, what we stumbled upon uh, a lot was how you could actually prove that somebody has violated the policy. Right. So that would actually involve and something. It's pesticides, that, not fertilizer. It's not fertilizer. It's just pesticides. And it's class uh, one and two. So there are allowable pesticides that this policy lets you use on those sections if you want. Again, it's town owned property, not yours. But if I, I understand, you know, that you want um, to have that little strip of lawn on the other side of your sidewalk look beautiful, I, I completely get that, and, and be pest free, I get that. Um, you know, so this does allow for um, pesticides to be used, it's very specific ones, and it's detailed in, in the policy itself. So the pesticides that are going to still be able to be used, how do they work on ticks? I don't know that off the top of my head. Because that's kind, of, that's kind of that an question. important question. I think. Yeah, sure. Um, I, mean, I don't necessarily think that's our place to determine which pesticides function for which pests. The sort of beyond. Okay, the scope. except that here I agree with that, Vanessa. But the, the the question is really it sounds specific, but it's really more general. So I mean, there are certain pests that we have to really be cautious of. The most common pesticide used for ticks, I believe, is like a <clears throat> permethrin based. Product I have that no clue. So. That, and that is not regulated okay. in, in these. Yeah. So I, I will say there is a, a clause in the policy that allows um, for um, the Board of Health and or the health agent to use these class one and class two um, pesticides in an emergency scenario. Um, so in other words, we have, okay, we have a huge problem here. These are the only two things that are going to fix it, but you've banned them. 
um, there is a pot there is a clause in here that allows for us to actually go ahead and and use that it's laid out for a specific period of time that you can do it for and then I think even upwards of a, a six-month extension to that um, original 30-day period of time for you for you um, to use those so there's an exception for exceptional circumstances there is yeah and, and that's determined um, I believe it's the I know it's the Board of Health but it might might also be in conjunction with the Health Department so we talked about or you talked about this would generally arise in the case of someone telling on someone else but it also looks like it would um, prohibit the town from procuring services that are going to use pesticides or subcontracting out um, to use pesticides since the use and it says the use and application um, would be prohibited on all town owned land so that would be an impact of this I don't know if that if I think currently the town does not use pesticides on the land is that right Bob? No. I, think so. I believe but that's what was told to us okay, so yeah right. So this would prohibit something that the town's not doing it anyway. Right, um, but it would it, it would in a sense okay. prohibit they, it from the they town. Do it. Spray pesticides in uh, water bodies for um, mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, mosquitoes, mosquitoes okay. They, they they act over the winter and they kill the larva. Um, but again, that's we're only talking about class one and class two here, right? Correct. Yeah. So, so um, doesn't mean the town doesn't use any pesticides. Or, or that it's just class one and class two. It, could I, um, so just to make sure, we're talking about, we're not talking about policy here, we're talking about regulation that has regulatory teeth, um, right? So, because um, policy was mentioned a number of times and um, regulations allow for enforcement. Um, so is it a regulation or is it a policy? A regulation. regulation. But okay. the first the first section does sound like a policy yeah. statement. And it does talk about um, and I was just I was curious actually if the board of health in, as part of this being an educational process would uh, or a, an educational opportunity for residents would um, would be discouraging the use of toxic pe toxic pesticides on public property because one of the you know I think Part three um, says that the purposes of the regs, number three, is to encourage the reduction and elimination of the use of toxic pesticides on private property. So would would there be kind of an education campaign by the Board of Health? Like would that roll out together? I don't know if that was a thought or it, that is something that was yeah, something we've discussed. I think we would definitely want to do that. Um, I think we also wanted to have a rollout period. In mm -hmm. other words, uh, if it rises to the level of uh, you voting to uh, allow this to go in place, it wouldn't be okay tomorrow. Here we go. Um, so you know there needs to be an educational part to one that we ha that we um, that there's a, been a change, um, and here's here's what that looks like. Here's what um, it entails. And I think the Board of Health uh, really needs to be the driver of that bus to make sure that the public understands fully what is allowable, what isn't allowable, and, and help them in that regard. Um, certainly to offer other ways uh, for not only just the town owned property but it's a great segue to offer ways for your private property as well too that you can use different um, mm -hmm. pesticides um, that are uh, safer uh, to use so and I didn't know if you well no, I go ahead go ahead uh, I, would you be able to walk us through the reasons for the the five exemptions first um, all outdoor pest management activities um, shall be subject to these regulations except um, includes uh, the number five uh, pesticide use on school property, for example. Um, I think basically these exemptions for the most part are making sure that we're not um, um, handcuffing uh, ourselves into, into kind of what don't we know. Um, type of policy, uh, type of, uh, excuse me, type of um, part to this regulation. So a lot of these, as you read through them, um, for example, um, two is talking about um, baits for traps for the purpose of rodent control. Mm -hmm. So this is just making sure that there's, there's some allowable things in here to make sure that we can control certain populations in one with rodent control. Um, three um, is talking about um, 
uh, the pesticide, this is the, the classification that the EPA has set up for the ones that are allowable. So this talks about ones that aren't level one, level two, uh, for example. So it's saying these are exceptions to this policy or this regulation, excuse me. Um, the pesticide use on school property, I think we actually have a, um, a typo in there. I think that's supposed to read 6C. It says National Law 132B. This should be 136 C. Um, no, National uh, Law has it. Um, uh, 132B, Section 6C section is the one I found that, that had the uh, schools, that referenced the schools. Got it, yeah. So I think we need to, I'm sure that'll be cut by town council. We'll, we'll mention that. Um, so a lot of these are just that. Um, uh, it's making sure that we we're not so cornered in, if that makes sense to you, that you know there is some use that we're gonna, um, that you could, you will need uh, potentially with this. I think, you know, we've all, I know with the Board of Health, we've been um, um, talking about rural control for over a year now too. So um, I wanna make sure that there are certain, certain guidelines in there uh, that allow for certain things. I think they're already pretty strict about pesticide use on school property and proximity to children, so. So, just to help guide this discussion, I'd, I'd like to get a sense of the board's feelings on if we are in agreement generally with this policy moving forward and then taking it from there. So, so that's question one. Do we have time for more questions? Oh, of course. You're not going to ask yeah. this question too? Uh, I'll get, well, question two is a question. <laughs> if everybody says no, then there is no question two. Yeah, I'm in favor of, of moving along with these regulations. Um, I, I, I'm in favor. I'm, I do have a question about the, um, the pesticide use on school property. Um, I do as well. Okay. Let's table that for just one sure. second. John? I'm interested in the scope of the problem currently. How much of this is going on in Reading on public property now? Um, How many of those little yellow signs we see all yeah, over the time? I'd have to say a lot. Well, Truthfully, I, I don't think anybody can, could actually answer that accurately, um, one way or the other. I mean, again, this is that's why the only way you can drive something like this is based on complaints. Um, we, you know, certainly wouldn't have the staff to go out and try to determine. I guess I'm trying to find out, Kevin. Is <clears throat> are we trying to are we trying to put a regulation in place for which we don't know? A current problem. I mean, the yellow signs indicate do not indicate pesticides. They indicate a hazardous, you know. I mean, fertilizers are certainly, you know, they get the yellow signs. They, they say pesticide on. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, I guess I've never seen one of those, so I, I, I don't get out much, I guess. But so, I guess I'm just really interested. I'm. I tend to feel in a general way that if you have a problem, we should address it. Mm -hmm. And the way you do that is you quantify the problem. I mean, I'm wondering if we've quantified a problem before we put another... I, I'm not in favor, generally speaking, of regulations for which there is not a clear problem. We may be about to say the same thing. <laughs> I think we investigated a lot of different routes because of thinking of different ways to enforce of how we actually go out and test and it became cost prohibitive to figure out you know how big of a random sample would you need to take and how much would it cost to test those samples and so because of the cost we relied on the principle of believing the importance of the policy rather than quantifying the problem as you say i mean i hear you that i mean did we do a blind survey to find out from the residents if they if they use such pesticides have we done that I just, I guess I personally feel like, you know, this may not, you know, may address a, a problem, maybe that problem, you know, we don't know the scope of that problem. It prevents future problems. Um, and, you know, public health is sort of a, a different area. You don't... Um, in the field of public health, you're, it's not like you're dealing in absolutes. You're looking for improvements without imp 
improvements while minimizing undue burden. And I think these regulations achieve both criteria. So, for example, the you know the Board of Health came to us some time ago with some pretty strong facts about um, tobacco use, flavored tobaccos, and all. I mean, all of those. And you know what? Um, much as I hated to see the business owners need to lose that revenue, it was pretty clear that the homework was done and that the facts were there and that, you know, something needed to be done in order to further regulate and, and manage an existing problem. So that's really, the, the, you know, the focus of my question. Mm -hmm. uh, believe me, I'm not trying to be aggressive or argumentative. I'm just, I have a general philosophy about government um, and how it's involved in our lives and it should look out for us and it should mitigate problems when they exist and I'm just wondering where we are with, with this particular problem. I mean we've already heard that it's it's challenging to quantify short yeah. of testing everyone's tree lawns. Right. So the No but I guess a survey would work, wouldn't you wouldn't it? Don't you think it would work? Don't you think a survey would be interesting? Well, there's also the I mean the way I see it, it's a matter of is it worth staff time to go out there counting little yellow lawn signs for a month? Um, or to institute a policy that realistically has a challenge with enforceability. However, the goal is ultimately education, right? It's to change behavior. So I don't know if, and I'm normally in agreement with you, I like data, but I don't know if this is one we necessarily need to quantify because that educational process that, they, that the Board of Health would go through, if that helps change the behavior, if it's 10% of property owners that use pesticides or 90%, it's still going to help lead towards an improved outcome, which is less pesticide use. Is there, is there a kind of broader question, John, about what does the science say about the impact of, or what is the public health impact of right. pesticide use? Well, that's, I mean... Like, we're broad... Yeah, and I know that you know, we don't have enough time tonight to, to hear yeah. about all those studies. And I'm sure there are studies that say, you know, class one and class two pesticides, you know, will make you grow an ear out of the middle of your forehead. I mean, you know, I'm sure yeah, high that levels of exposure. Yes, I mean, I mean, we just heard a, you know, a forty-two billion dollar settlement in California uh, around, you know, a, a, a pesticide. So, um, John, I, I, so, I, so I'd like to ask beyond the ability or inability to scope out the extent of the transgressions at this point, um, are you amenable to moving forward with the policy discussion as it stands? Well, I, I'm amenable to having a, to continuing a discussion. I, I personally think that there are some steps we could have taken along the way, and I, you know, it's not an indictment, it's just an observation. Um, you know, I, what I have noticed over the years is that um, the idea of, you know, of, uh, of public surveys in this town seem to be embraced rather warmly. People participate in them. Um, Unless we're asking if they're doing something that we're about to ban. <laughs> no, but they're, no, they're, I mean, they're, they're blind. This is not, you know, you don't give your email address and, you know, and, you know, where the, where your yellow sign is located. <laughs> Um, it's just a jet. I'm just yeah, trying to understand. I'm I, just trying to understand uh, if there's honestly, a, if there's for the a, most a, part, a I don't know if um, I don't know. Even if you put out a survey, and I I, I, I tend to agree with you. Um, you know, the more data, the better um, from a decision-making standpoint. Um, I don't know that a survey would come back with with good data, just because I, I doubt people are going to realize what their company is putting on where. Right. Um, I think people Isn't that the education issue, though? So that brings that begs my next question, which is, where as a board of health are you headed, planning to head, from an educational standpoint? Because look, I mean, I think it's within your purview to do this. I don't know that you need a vote from the board of selectmen in order to be able to do it. So, so there's there's two. We things have here. public property. We are the keepers of the public property. So there's that. 
So, um, John, to, to answer your question, um, as far as far as the policy goes, because as Andy pointed out, it is regulation and there are fines implied, yeah. it's not just a policy, um, it does require the select board approval. So from where we stand now, the next steps are, if we're in agreement with the policy, if we have changes to it, now would be a good time to provide them to the Board of Health or if they need to answer any questions that we may have um, so that they can incorporate it, because the next step is for it to go to Ray Town Council for his review. At that point, we would need to potentially incorporate any changes he may have, and then we as a board would vote to institute this regulatory at action. A, at a public hearing. At a public hearing, thank in, you. In his guidance, he'd rather um, our boards figure out what, if anything, they want, and then have that be put in front of them, uh, the town council it is for review, because uh, we did, uh, we voted on the last um, amendment that we made to the regulation and we, we sent in where he said no if you're going to have the select board involved you should really have both boards on the same page that verbiage in front of me at that point and then they can look at it so that's why it hasn't been looked at uh, before it came to you well I, I mean i personally i don't question the veracity of the way that the documents when you've you've primarily lifted it from another municipality who's had it enforced for 30 or 40 years right um and if it was going to be challenged i guess it would have been challenged by now so I guess one could make an assumption that from a form st standpoint it's solid um, and I guess Ray would you know give it the give, give it the once over not he doesn't give it a once over he gives it a thorough look yep. as he does everything um, I mean right now he's found something that we were probably doing wrong 50 years ago um, and continue to do wrong and we've had that we found this more often than not so maybe we're going to find that the Marblehead um, document has got some holes so you know from a form standpoint I have no objection okay. substance standpoint I, I, I have questions and you know and I've raised some of them and you know the last one is I'm interested in what the Board of Health is going to do if the true goal here is to educate people the town owned property in question I mean, at my house I've got almost an acre I got a four foot strip that belongs to the town um, I, so if I'm doing something on you know on my land that is not controlled by the Board of Selectmen um, then we've kind of defeated the purpose haven't we so education, if, if education is the real answer, so, my, my challenge, my question is, what will the Board of Health do to educate the town of Reading? So, John, I think just to keep us on track as far as what the ask is for tonight, I, I mean, from what I heard from the Board of Health, they are interested in providing educational opportunities, and they have started to explore what those might look like. Yeah, and I can answer that really quickly. You know, we, we discussed rolling up um, this regulation in uh, things like tax bills as well as um, water bills. Um, water bills usually get read more than tax bills, but we, you know, <laughs> thought you, you double up just to be sure. They do it, my uh, So, uh, again, we we want there to be a grace period where people are are made aware of it. And we also, um, as from a board standpoint, we fully um, fully plan to hold um, some kind of public um, event. I'm sure it'll be highly attended um, to to discuss these new uh, regulations and and what it entails. My my biggest thing is uh, again um, the part that I like in here is the is the section that details um, specifically through either the EPA or through Mass General Law what is classified as one or or classified as a two and what alternatives could be and I think that's where the education comes into and, and you're right it falls on the Board of Health without a doubt yep. to make sure that people are well aware of that. So I I'd like to just ask a quick question. Um, does the board have an ability to communicate with the pesticide companies? Because that would be a lot more efficient than homeowners. You just stole my thunder, Bob. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of the corollary to what you were saying before with tobacco. But please continue. Yeah. No, that's all. Just yeah. a question. Yeah, I don't see why not. I, I think that certainly is a great um, part of the rollout process. Because if you were that's to ask first. me a question, I would, and I, I don't do this, but I would turn to the pesticide company and say, yeah. what do you do? Right. I would have no idea. Right. Well, that's why I thought, uh, you know, I... I I, surveys are great. I thought a survey in this instance may not be beneficial because of that. I think you get backs across reference, maybe not 100% accurate data. So unless there are additional questions from a broader philosophical perspective, why don't we take a few minutes to address the actual policy itself, and if anybody has questions, I, I know I have a couple, but I'll see if anybody else wants to chime in. 
Andy. Me too. Um, first of all, overall, <coughs> a really well written regulation. Um, and I know that the town council has gone over this a number of times. Um, not yet. Yeah. Well, not this latest draft, not but the, the, the main 90% uh, of it, yes. Um, and so I get one question I have is I, I, I don't understand um, under ex exemptions, the exemptions, um, you have all outdoor pest management activities taking place on the town of Reading owned land shall be subject to these regulations except as follows and then you list that and then at the end of that in the same section it says any town department or contractor granted a waiver here under shall, here under shall uh, comply with all of the regs blah, blah, blah. so it is the implication that um, That these exemptions need a waiver, I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused. So I, I that ties back into um, the section that allows, and let me see if I can find it. That does allow for the health department and uh, the board of health to. That's okay. I got it right in front of me. Thank you. That's for um, everyone else to see, though. <laughs> um, oh, <laughs> I'll see if I can find it. Um, there's, there is a section that that refers to the Board of Health's ability to uh, yeah. allow exemption for, for class one and two and that is the referring to now the application if they're granted that waiver um, they still have to abide by the, the Massachusetts uh, laws in regards to how that those two or the, that type of uh, pesticide can be applied yeah yeah that's what it's referring to I'll see if I can I know that section uh, <coughs> is in here for someone else tell sees it let me know Exemption for yeah. Exemption for. Okay. Oh, okay. I got excessive. it. So, just a, a small recommend, you know, recommendation for clarity. Switch four and five, and and put. Yeah. So they're um, next to each the, other. <laughs> uh, the um, it, this paragraph belongs under four. So gotcha. either move it under yeah. four. Or okay. Switch four and five. So I had a question under section eight. Yes. So ACE is the violation. Fifty dollars first offense, hundred dollars for second and subsequent. And then D is citations of violations of these regulations may be in such form as the Board of Health may determine. D makes it sound like the amount is variable and determined by the Board of Health as a and seems in conflict with B. So in one, you're saying mm -hmm. these are the set amounts. In D, D, we're saying we can override the set amounts. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know what you want to do with that, but I, they're not really in agreement. They could be in, open for interpretation. Sure. Now, granted, if what is it, Marble? Head yeah, my, I guess it was yeah. left. It was left there as a as a back door for uh, the Board of Health and Marblehead um, to. To have an egregious offenses, be more than a set okay. uh, figure of hundred dollars. It's my guess. I don't. If, if I'd, have to, I'd have to contact. I'd, I'd have to contact <laughs> the, them um, for the, that determination. But that's the only thing I could see that that clause would be used for. Okay. I'll, I'll defer to Ray on that one. Okay. And my second one was, um, given that this will apply to school land as well, have they been notified in any capacity as far as the fact that we're considering these? As a courtesy, I feel like it would be appropriate to let them know in the case they have any concerns about the policy. Um, don't they manage and control that property? Because we don't. <coughs> I'm not sure where that line is. What, I'm do you know? pretty sure um, that they it really do. does depend. DPW does a lot of work around the school property, but not on the school per se. Just like shoveling snow, <coughs> which is facilities, school custodian, which is DPW, is. Um, so would this policy, though, extend to what do you school think, Chris? property? Um, I think it's right. It's right on the border. Yeah, it's right. It's bordered. Yeah, borderline. So we really should, as a courtesy, uh, talk as to a the courtesy, I think it would be nice if you could chat to the school committee to bring them in. The reason I bring that up is when we when so, we talk to the schools about <coughs> certain recreational places, right? They have they have domain over it. 
permit. Yeah, we so, do not. So, yeah, that, so there's a line in here that references the town-owned land that these regulations pertain to are the sidewalks and tree lots. So it doesn't reference this regulation. Actually, doesn't reference any school property. So do you even? So do you need the exemption for pesticide use in school property if? That's a great question. Well, yeah. do we yeah. still it's own the tree lawn? Yeah, we do. We there's do. still a tree lawn over there, right? Yeah. So, but but then it. Oh, on school property. So it would apply to the tree lawn along the school property. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is, is that still school property or is that town property? I guess yeah. is the question, but. It depends on how you define town land. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, I schools think, are part of the town. Right. So. Right. I think just as a just courtesy and precautionary measure, it might be yeah. nice to reach out to them. They may not have any concerns, but they may, or their council may flag something. Okay. And that would be my opinion. And I, uh, I think the um, exemption Evan? language. Like light department? Um, pesticide use on school property um, as governed by. Still all, they, they only work on the town owned. Yeah, too many meetings going on. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, I think that the exemption five pesticide use on school property is governed by MGL chapter 132B. And you said that's section 6C, which yeah, is I found all about that notice, 6C. Which is about when um, notice needs to be required for. for for the spraying or putting down of pesticides on Correct. school property. So I don't actually know what the exemption means in that case. Does it mean that, um, that pesticides can be put down on school property as long as the, the, you know, the general laws notice requirements are met? Or does it mean um, that notice requirements need to be, these notice requirements need to meet, be met, but otherwise the um, the pesticide restrictions that apply to the to the rest of the town only and also apply. Yeah, um, it's yeah, absolutely yeah, ambiguous. Question. I think it is again. You know, it's where we adopted this from another town. I, right. My guess is a lot of this um, came up. This seems like a um, clause where there is an exemption. They want to make sure that that exemption is um, is through what the mass general law has established for, uh, just like you said for notice uh, for doing so. So. Um, that's that's the best I could. Yeah, I, I, can I guess that. I can't tell from the the from the language whether the intention is to um, to make for, for if there's pesticides that are going on school property for that to be um, more restrictive and subject to the the notice requirements under the general laws, or in fact less restrictive that as long as the notice requirements at the state level are complied with, then. Um, then there's no problem with the laying of pesticides on school property, which would which would be, seem to be contrary to the to the stated intent um, and protection of um, of of public health, particularly for kids. So. Yeah, you know that may just be a um, a legal question um, <laughs> to to pose to to Ray. Um, I guess so is from a. a to before we get to the legal question, which I think there probably is one, but but from like the intent of the Board of Health is the intent to to um, to so prohibit. We, we don't or? have um, well. This That's regulation correct. doesn't control school-owned property, so it's not referencing okay. field. It's again, it's referencing the tree lawns um, okay. that are joining to that. Where my guess is this was put in here because it is a school and the schools are do fall in certain guidelines mm -hmm. from Mass General Law as far as notice is concerned. That it's saying if that exemption is used on those tree lawns okay. uh, that are, that's abutting the schools, that it has to go through the Mass General Law um, okay. 132B Section 6C, which has proper notice given um, for okay. using them. Again, that's why I say I think that's a legal question to ask Ray. Is this why it was stuck in here? Um, usually, I found with any of these things that have been looked at by attorneys as a reason why it was stuck in there um, that for one. So either it was a problem or it was something that was caught before it was a problem. So I, I defer to Ray on that. I was just going to add that um, town council is very good about not accepting a single word in any policy without it being defended. Because I'm usually the butt of all that. <laughs> what, are you, what are you trying to accomplish? What does this mean? Um, he, he will ask all these questions. Um, he will try to understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish. 
Um, and in this case, in this policy, I think the board is probably going to get a lot of feedback from council. Not, not to do with what should it look like, how should it be put together, just what are you trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. I suspect you will get that feedback. So, Vanessa, the, 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 I think what they're trying to accomplish is stated in the f first part, and I have a question about that. Um, but I think the exemption three may not be necessary because uh, 40 CFR, it's the Federal Register, right? Um, Code of Federal Regulations. Code of Federal, federal Regulations. Um, that talks about pesticides that uh, don't require FIFA regulation. So I, I think it may be, number one, duplicative, and number two, there's no, there don't appear, it's like walnut shells and bone meal. It's all pretty non-toxic stuff. So I don't think there are any class one or class two pesticides um, that are covered by 40 CFR. Something can you to look into. that as a question for Ray? Yeah, I, I, well I can tell you the answer to it right now is, you know, um, we wanted to make sure that if you roll this out that it's not talking just solely about what you can't use but what you could use. So this is just giving uh, a reference and a resource uh, to people to look up, okay, this is an ex this is acceptable. This is an okay. exception to the rule. So I, I personally prefer to keep that in there because I think that just goes back to the education component of it. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, and then I had one more question. Bob stole my um, education component about contacting the, um, if these regulations pass, contacting the pesticide companies that service Reading and just saying, be aware these are a new, um, uh, these are new regulations and, and people, just for the record, I think we should be careful about not using policy, calling this policy because it's, it's regulation. regulation. We keep slipping into policy, it's, it's easy. Um, I'll let somebody ask a question while I find the part that I don't understand. I have one. Is the, is the target the tree lawns, is that it? That's what, that's re it references it right in here. Um, the town-owned land that these regulations pertain to are sidewalks and tree lawns. So, and, it, and it's, I think the sidewalks, which is it, which was really driven um, this regulation to begin with. That that's where people are walking over, with you know strollers going over, or walking their dogs. Um, um, that you know, if you're putting the pesticide on the tree lawn, that it's spilling into the sidewalk. And I think that was where this was originally driven from the concern. So you're really not interested in the parks you're not interested in um, the public space in front of this building well I think the town already doesn't use already doesn't use this yeah. Yeah. yeah but to, to, John, to John's point why don't we have it in there yeah I I, I just think this needs yeah. to work yeah I mean I, I I'm really open to the to the discussion and the education of you know keeping people safer and I think that's a good idea um, this seems like it, it may you know the document may need some work, and I think Ray is actually the guy that will, as, as Bob points out, we have seen now over the course of the last two or three years that he has been working on not a not a document like this, but you know a similar idea. Sure. Um, uh, and I know you've seen this, Kevin. Yep. I mean, you know, he, he really gets down to some practical questions. He does. About what are you trying to accomplish? How are you trying to get there? What do you really want to have happen? Have you thought about this? I mean, and I think that's what we are going to hear from a feedback standpoint. So, John, I, Bob just actually gave me an interesting bit of information, which is that we don't actually control, we as the select board don't actually have authority over all of those lands necessarily. So this policy specific to the tree lawns is under our purview. Okay. Hence the limitation. The parks we do. Not all of them. No, because the schools have some of them. And common. Um, and then there's also the land that they, uh, that the public utility owns. And right. what are they so, using? So in the... Yeah. I, mean, I mean, the Section 4 doesn't, is not limited, or the, lang the language of the prohibition in Section 4 does not seem to be limited to tree lawns. It says the use and application of to toxic chemical pesticides by private contractors and or by citizens or others is prohibited on all town-owned lands. That's pretty, that's pretty encompassing. Um, so I think I want to be conscious of time. Um, I, 
we've, I think, had a good discussion about this and raised some interesting points. Mm -hmm. um, how does the board feel about asking the Board of Health to consider our questions, maybe do a little bit of additional legwork, um, and we can invite you back? Um, we'd be happy to have you. Um, how does that sound? Sounds good. I found my one more Did question. Okay, very, very, I found it. it's very, it's in the th uh, the third paragraph of the regulations, section one, intent. Um, last last line. It says, um, "What's well, long?" I'll read the last the last bit that I don't understand. Um, section. In section one, third paragraph, last line. It says, "And to introduce and promote natural, organic." cultural and management practices to prevent and when necessary control pest problems on town owned land. What is the promote natural, I understand natural, I understand organic, cultural, I understand the words, I just don't understand the combination of organic, cultural, mm -hmm. I don't understand what cultural means in, in that context. Could just say organic management practices. Yeah, that's yeah. Just probably just change the wording. Yep. Well, it's been there. <laughs> yeah. Who knows what that may have meant 30 years ago. Yeah, that's so a good, good pick up in, in marble. I imagine it means sort of the culture and philosophy of the no tree yeah. Yeah. sustainable organic yeah. practices. Yeah. 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 Is, the intent, necessary. is the intent section pulled primarily from the Marblehead document? Most, so I was just actually wondering, uh, from sort of an update in the last 30 to 40 years, um, that you know, part of the intent language says, um, when an activity raises threats of harm, even if some cause and effect relationships are not yet fully established. And I was just wondering what the board of, uh, because I am not, I, I, I'm not as familiar with the science here. Um, if the Board of Health feels like there is a strong cause and effect relationship established today, 30 to 40 years later, between pesticide use and health impacts. Okay. <laughs> so is there anything else that we would like to ask of the Board of Health while we have them here? Okay. So, um, Kevin, why don't we connect about once you have a chance to discuss how you'd like to proceed, um, and then we can get you on a future agenda, if that would work for you. Okay. Is that good? All right, wonderful. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Taking initiative on this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, just uh, real quickly, uh, motion to adjourn. Oh. Do I get the motion? Either one. <laughs> <laughs> you can suck it. <laughs> yeah. All is in favor. <laughs> All right. Four health is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Let's take a two minute break. <laughs>
So next up, we have the at our pre one, our previous meeting we had discussed the idea of a select board onboarding manual. So we've only got a couple minutes here, really, on this one on this agenda item to decide if this is something we want to pursue, and if so, um, maybe we can create a working group as opposed to a subcommittee. Um, the difference there just being it gives us a little bit more flexibility in how we meet, and then that working group can prevent present the information um, to the rest of the board. Is it something we want to do? Yeah, I, I feel strongly about it. Well, you know, having sort of now being in year two, I, I think it would have been really helpful. Yeah. yeah. John, as our, as our veteran on the board. I, you know, it's, um, it can't hurt anything. It can only help. I mean, I, I don't see any downside to having material available for a, for a new person on this board. No. Um, the question is assembling it. I mean, the scope of what we do yeah. is monstrous. Well, I've already you homogenized that. I've already made, uh, I pulled out a list of everywhere, every time it mentions the Board of Selectmen in, um, or is it now switched to Select Board, in the bylaws and the chart. So I pulled out all of those citations, mm -hmm. and they serve, in fact, they're in our... We'll be switched to the bylaws, but not the charter. That's right, that's right. But but I pulled out all of those um, obligations that, you know, that we, we have under those two jobs. I think jobs. we have a volunteer for the working group. <laughs> the board involves. Yeah, I, I, I would love to do that because I, I would have benefited greatly yeah. uh, for that. I think we all would have. Um, who, uh, I know Mark's absent should we volunteer him since <laughs> Oh, I think that's a great idea. I, 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 so, second. second. Yeah. 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 One of the things that we should have in there is that you have to show up. <laughs> and, and children's graduations, you know. Was for oh, your four years of college, you don't need, you don't, you don't need to go to that. Just write checks. And do you have any interest? Um, I certainly can think of things that um, would, would have been helpful to know, um, but I also don't know what I don't know yet. Right. So... We could, one of the things we could also do is, you know, at one of our, say, July agendas, meetings that has a lighter agenda, have a 20-minute brainstorm session where everybody mm. just throws out ideas and then, mm -hmm. and then Andy can make it better. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> well, you, could, you could interview That's the Boy Scouts idea. that I put the, put the thing on every year for, you know, with the 30 things that the, that the people on this board do. I think that's oh, that's, yeah. a, that's a good idea, actually. Right. So um, why don't we? The scouts? But <laughs> well, why having the little, you know, uh, what sort of things do we want in there? Because it's more than just the bylaws and. Okay. So since Mark's not here, I won't actually volunteer him, <laughs> though I am tempted. Um, so, but we can put that on a future agenda, and then at that point, so all five of us are here, yeah. and you can find. Someone does support okay. that effort. Yeah. yeah, and that'll be. Can that be one of our annual goals? Yes. We have to get credit for it. Mm. If we don't. We don't get credit for it. It's mm. like we never did. Do oh. you need a gold star? I I want a gold star <laughs> on my fridge. <laughs> okay. Um, great. So unless there's any other discussion on that, we'll move right along. Great. So. The next item on the agenda, it's listed as charter change allow non-residents as volunteer board members. So the reason this got brought up is because the question was raised of are there instances where a non-resident um, could or should be a voting member of one of our boards. So I've gotten a couple calls about this. Um, as I had considered this, it wasn't meant to include elected boards or regulatory setting boards. Um, it would be for anything beyond that. So select board would be excluded, CPDC, ZBA, conservation, FinCom, um, none of those would necessarily be open to having a non-resident serve. Um, but any of the others could, it could be an option. So I don't necessarily know if this is, this isn't something that we as a board could institute. Um, my question was, is this something we want to ask the bylaw committee to look into because this would be a charter issue? And does, the by, does the bylaw committee review possible changes to the charter? Yeah. You have to have a separate. Okay. Um, so, general thoughts? 
I have a question. Um, when are these, uh, I assume these out-of-towners um, are brought in because of some area of expertise? Could be an area of expertise. It could be um, a perspective that we're lacking in yeah. town yep. um, due to our demographics. Yep. Could be a business owner that lives out of town but would like to be on uh, you know, like an economic development committee. Yeah, and if there, there is the concern there that, you know, I've seen, thanks to a helpful resident, um, provided some information on Concord, who does allow this. Uh -huh. um, and they limit it to non-regulatory boards. They limit the number of non-residents that can serve mm -hmm. on a particular board or committee um, so that no one committee, could, regardless of what it is, could be made up of a majority of the mm -hmm. towns. Not that I would foresee that being a legitimate well, struggle, I, but we could build it in if, if by law decided that was something we wanted to So the immediate question for me is, um, why would we need to have a person from out of town be on a committee that would vote on a policy or a direction for a resident? I don't, I don't, I mean, I have no problem with bringing in talent that can add value. I have no problem with a non-voting associate member of, of almost any committee, frankly. Um, but I don't really see a, a non-resident being a voting member on any committee at any time for any reason. That's just, that's a personal opinion of mine. Um, and interestingly, when, when our agenda hit, and there was, you know, it's listed as charter change, allow non-residents as volunteer boards. I'm sure you, you know, you've got some questions about what that really meant, um, and I did as well. Um, I, you know, I, I've heard from nine different people, either by email or by phone call or by text, um, who, I guess this is not shocking that they would reach out to me um, they they seem to share my thoughts that I just shared with you my personal thoughts I, I'm all for any volunteer talent that wants to help us be better and be more astute on any topic I'm all for that um, the idea of engaging them as a voting member of a committee I, I actually don't see any any real purpose in doing that there are instances where it would be beneficial to the benefit of Reading to have a non-resident, um, someone who is engaged in our community um, and invested in our community, not necessarily financially, um, but who is a member of the community and may not necessarily live here. But why do they need to vote on matters of policy? It's a matter of inclusivity. Uh, well, I, I, I disagree with that. I think that if you live here, you should have the right to vote on any topic that comes up and if you raise your hand to be a volunteer member of a committee board or commission um, and you clear the hurdles of the VASC or other you know um, appointing bodies if it's not the VASC um, and the Board of Selectmen then you should be able to vote on everything um, but I, I honestly think the residential requirement is key to voting on anything um, I, I welcome I welcome the help but um, I, don't I see think the there point are in times when Reading may not have um, the either skill set or attributes that we might be looking for in a committee that could benefit Reading, but somehow Reading lacks that individual. <laughs> I disagree, and we can respectfully disagree with each other on that. Fair, Fair enough. enough. Do you know? more specifically what the motivation for this is is there a, a specific committee currently that has members that are non-residents and it's it's creating a problem with creating a quorum or is there is is there something motive what what is really motivating this I've got a feeling as the Beatles said um, that was lost on everybody for me. <laughs> um, anybody? Thank you. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, it's possible that um, the ad hoc committee that we're on uh -huh. to look at forming uh, uh, a human rights mm -hmm. um, board, um, there are 
and if, if it's done in collaboration with the schools, mm -hmm. um, there are there's a population of so students. Uh, can who I interrupt? Yes, Andy? please do. Thank you. Um, so, for example, um, if we were to ask using the ad hoc as an example, mm -hmm. um, we may ask um, religious organizations to participate. Mm -hmm. um, for example, <coughs> Reading doesn't have a synagogue. Mm -hmm. So if we were to ask a rabbi to join that, and we do have religious leaders in that one, sure. though not necessarily a rabbi, sure. um, that rabbi who would be helping us address some of the issues that we have in town would not have voting rights. Um, and this is th that's a particularly large um, ad hoc. I think there's about 15 members. Mm -hmm. um, but it puts us in an awkward situation where we're asking someone to participate, um, and they are dedicating their time to us, and we're saying, but you don't get to vote. I think that's, I was sort of trying to be discreet about it, but that's where we end up. Yeah, I, I, and so we, we are asking, we who are dealing with an exclusionary or an inclusionary and diversity issue are creating second class citizens within our own committees. I completely disagree with that outlook, but everybody's entitled to an opinion. I, I actually asked the same question that Ann brings. I mean, what is there a specific situation that's driving it? Is the is it the current ad hoc committee? Is that is that where the problem? Is it, that where it, be, it was it, raised as part of the ad hoc? Um, we were able to sort of work with ad hoc because it was it's a temporary committee. But if a situation, if we create, for example, a human rights commission, and we want to include, which would then presumably become a permanent. Well, all of those are pretty big leaps. I mean, you know, right. we're way, we're far, well, far away from that. Yes, and we're also far from instituting anything like this. So the, the idea is not to say whether this is right or wrong. The intention is simply to ask if bylaw would be willing to perhaps do some research, see what other towns do, and advise on whether or not this is an, an avenue we want to pursue. I would not support that. Okay. Are there other... Um, are there other situations that where this um, we anticipate this being beneficial, or is it really looking at this one example? It's sort of, it's hard to predict the future. I think the Human Rights Commission is the most a potential Human Rights Commission, the most obvious one in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not so much actually about the ad hoc committee. It was it, it was be. raised due to the creation of the ad hoc. And so therefore there are implications for future boards, committees, and commissions. So the idea is, again, to explore the possibility of it, not necessarily to, for us to determine whether it's something we should or can do, um, but simply to ask for information. And that would work. So what's the ask tonight? If this is something we would be interested in asking the bylaw to committee to look into. I, I think it's worthwhile exploring. And that's all it is. It would be exploratory at this point. Is the Shadow Review Committee? Yes. We're not, we're not there yet. Yes, Bob. I'm just, I call it the general bylaws. It also is a bylaw at 3.3.1.3 residency requirement. So it's not just charter, it's bylaw and charter. Mm -hmm. um, just as a point of information, I had a similar question with the Charter Committee, which I'm sure Bill remembers a few years ago. I asked the same question Is residency required for boards and committees? Um, I had a few battles with the committee. This was one of the ones I lost almost unanimously. What John said was what that charter com committee at the time said back. Um, and and yeah. that was twice, Bob. And, and the ex you know the expertise was was most welcome, but not any kind of decision making ability on the town residents. Mm -hmm. I, I understand both sides of the issue because I was pretty much arguing your side with the charter committee, and I just thought you should know that's the feedback they got, and. Um, when was this? Uh, three, four three years, years ago. ago. And, and I've sat on the committee uh, charter review twice, and that's very strongly no. Do we have non-voting members? Do we have non-voting non-voting non-resident members of other committees no. in town yeah. right now? Okay. See, to me, that is actually a, a really good thing to look at. Yeah. Is to create a non-voting non associate position. Yeah. If somebody has an interest or. If I know someone that lives in the next town and I'm on a committee and I feel like that person could add a lot of value, um, I ask them to, you know, go through a VASC, 
process uh, for an associate non-voting position. I, I personally think that's there's real value added to that. Um, there's also value added when we have a perspective that isn't well represented in town. And the ad hoc committee and a potential human rights commission are key examples of that. We are not a diverse community. Okay, but what, what requires a person who comes to add the value of the perspective, why is it mandatory that that person have a vote on something that affects the future of a Reading resident? Because they could very well have an invest, a personal investment, not a financial one, in our community, and we would be denying them a vote into something that they have a vested interest in. Well, so a personal investment meaning that they have friends, family, or business here? Possibly. Okay. And so to that end, their, their expertise, their input, their... their so ignored. No, don't, please don't put words in my mouth. I no, that I was volunteering okay. that as an outcome. Um, so, you know, in my opinion, they wouldn't be ignored. It just, it's a matter of who gets to vote for, I mean, you vote on the things that affect you and your neighbors. I mean, inside of our zip code, you know, those people that live here um, should be able to vote on anything that affects their future. Um, people that live in the Wakefield zip code, I mean, let's take the example. They're not particularly interested in, you know, what's going to happen to the people on Hopkins Street. I mean, this morning, you know, people sat on the Hopkins Bridge for so 35 minutes. I want to focus this back on the This is, this is focused right on this thing. And what I'm saying is that I think you're going to find that most people feel pretty strongly about the fact that Reading residents should be voting on Reading's future. That's what I think. I think it's an area that needs to be revisited. I understand um, John's point of view, and I think it, 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 at first glance, um, probably many in town uh, would would understand that. Why is a non-resident allowed to vote on a, on a board and on a town board or a community or commission? Um, but I do think what Vanessa is saying warrants some, warrants some looking into. Um, uh, yeah, so I guess that's where I, where I come out. I totally come, I understand where you're coming from, John, um, and I respect it. Um, but there seems to be more than meets the eye here, and I think it'd be okay. Yeah, I'm fine with exploring it further. So this would be a bylaw uh, change, Bob, and a town charter change. Please, so, yeah. Yeah, because the town town charter says anytime you create, you know, in 4.14, it says anytime you create another, uh, anytime an elected board or, or you know, any time an elected board or committee creates um, an, an other board or committee under them, um, the members have to reside in the town. So, so yeah. All right. So I, we've. I, I, as um, one of the the newly appointed ad hoc committee members, I and with the hope that we're going to be meeting possibly as soon as next week. I'm just wondering if it makes sense to have a, con it sounds like you did have a conversation about this at the first meeting. Is that right? Not, no, it was, um, uh, Barry and I had this conversation. Oh, like, I see, yeah, I see. Okay. The creation of it, because the issue the was Okay. Uh, so. I was just wondering if it's something that, if it emerges out of the ad hoc committee process as something that, that they're in, that, that they'd be interested in seeing, then we could have maybe a more tailored ask to the bylaw committee as to what to look into. This came out of uh, Kenny. No, uh, excuse me, Bill. Okay. Um, I mean, if you're meeting next week, you could, we could bring this up again at our next meeting. Hopefully have a brief discussion about it. Just picking up where we left off. And see if there's, you know, is there an interest, in, is, is there, is this something that um, that the members of the ad hoc committee feel is is important? Is it important that there be 
um, the availability not just for non-residents to, to participate but also to vote like what what's the mm -hmm. um, what are the priorities and then um, I think it's a value statement yeah. is what it amounts to is there do you think there's a value in um, well, in terms of what we're going to be going to the bylaw committee with, though, is there a value outside of the context of um, an organization that's working on inclusivity and diversity and human rights? Like, does this make sense for them to sort of chime in? I'm sorry? For them to chime in? Yeah. On the boards. Uh, or I'm. I'm um, for them to chime in. But for the ad hoc committee to weigh in on. Oh well, if the that if that is? if that's what if that's the thought as or the motivation driving this, then um, I think it, I think that it could be. Uh, but but I'm also just wondering before we go to um, the bylaw committee, I think it might make sense for us to have thought about like what the what the parameters of the ask is. Is this you know so not I'm not you know when you said non-regulatory. Committee, I wasn't actually sure what that meant. You know, what, where, what track would be an example? <laughs> okay, because they don't set regulation or policy, they, they are, uh, they exist in an advisory capacity. And to respond to um, events in town that fall into their purview, so they, okay. so I think that's a good point. Um, would the two of you like to take that back to the ad hoc? Sure, it does. It does look like we'll be meeting Tuesday. I, I just okay. need to come check with them. All right. So I think that sounds great. Um, so let's essentially put a pin in this until our next meeting. And then continue, continue the conversation. And continue on. Perfect. Okay. Great. Thank you. So next <coughs> up, we have the select board goals update for the new members. Um, Mark will have to watch on video. <laughs> so um, I already handed off ad hoc to Andy and Ann. I, I do owe you an update as far as what took place oh, at the yeah. previous meeting, but we can do that offline. Um, John and I have to meet on uh, capital projects, yep. which will now include Oakland Road as well as Simon's Way. Mm -hmm. um, can someone remind me some of the other? I'm trying to find them. I'm just yes, going out there. You just got it. Yep. Um, so. What page is that? Oh, 30, 36. 36. Uh, housing Trust, the new EDC, and those are both Andy and uh, Mark on both of those. I think it's 37, right? Uh, yeah, it is 37. 37 of the PDF, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And then the RMLD payments is... Um, oh, that's uh, me and Mark. That's you and Mark. Yeah. Um, so there's not a lot to update there. Um, RMLD has a meeting next... or tomorrow, actually. Um, so I'll need to connect with them as far as getting that... either creating a new subcommittee or... or working group to start discussing that so there's not a lot to report there beyond what was already reported at town meeting the new edc you know what I, I imagine that andy and mark you'll have to meet we've with. already started oh. communicating oh, and, um, okay. but i so vanessa i have a question some of the were these all these goals mm -hmm. i forget whether they were created at all as subcommittees or it's it seems like Dan and I just decided we wanted a subcommittee so we had a subcommittee no, but were, were created as subcommittees they were all created as subcommittees except for the ad hoc committee except there, as, a, as a general philosophy I mean I think one of the struggles that Barry and I had on communications was that by being an official subcommittee we had to post we had to meet in a public building. Yeah. Um, it made it tough for us to meet on a Saturday morning over coffee and just chat. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
No, not because we didn't want to be open to the public, because obviously anything that results from that conversation needs to be brought before the full board, but simply because we wanted to share a Google Doc and we couldn't do it. Right. Um, Right. Mm -hmm. You know, to make changes to policy. So I, I don't know if the board, I don't know what the poli pro process would be to potentially. <coughs> I can That's check with town council, but historically, if the town manager or the superintendent form working groups and invite you to participate, that's not open meeting law. Don't can it, we form working groups? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it, it seems bizarre to me. It just it's, makes it really like a, challenging, yeah. Well, it, yeah, I understand your challenge totally, but it also seems like if that's true and I do that, I'm circumventing open meeting mm -hmm. law. Yeah, I don't want to do that either. Well, it, it's not legally, it's just <laughs> spiritually. Spirit, right. <laughs> um, yeah, if you can connect with Ryan, we'll Ray. keep moving, we'll follow the proper procedure. Um, yeah. I just think we'll be more efficient if we can yeah. you know, share a Google Doc. Share a Google Doc. I mean, you know, state law just does not cut up with technology, so. Yeah, these, um, I, I, I don't know where these subcommittees are listed uh, on our on our town website or... They're right on your They're on the Select Board page. They're right they're on, top. They're on the, yeah, they're on our page. Very right. top link on might your need, It yeah. might need so updating. Why does it always do that? Hmm? It might need updating. I thought I was... I, I thought it. I found it there. I just looked okay. in Dan's... Yeah, actually, yeah. I, I really? Think, yeah, that's... Okay, so, okay never mind. I, I think we were in good shape there, Bob. Yeah, until the next meeting, yeah. next meeting, you can just an update. Yep. That would be great. Um, so next on the agenda is the select board office hours um, to discuss the hours and locations. Um, I I had raised this as a potential idea. Um, you know, office hours. I think Anne, you had them today. I don't know if you had anyone come visit you. No, she didn't. Oh, it's okay. the next one. Yep. Next, next one. Sorry, apologies. Same. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, I hope not. Um, so the idea of hosting them in different locations. So, for example, we have writing friends and family coming up. Um, do we want to have a booth? Do we want to set up a table and we can take turns staffing it if we plan on attending and, and we each hang out for an hour? Um, do we want to do them at the library? I've tried this and I've met with people. It's been nice, actually. Um, you know, have, Bob had put in a, a pitch for the senior center, which I think would be very well received. I went there for one of the lunches. It was great to get out there and, and yep. meet very some of the seniors in the community. Okay. So I, I think asking people to come to us is not necessarily the best approach. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. we need to get out into the community more. This here goals is all. I agree. To meet with people. It has so I would be happy to just start doing one at the senior center. I mean, I'm available in the day. Which is when they're there, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, more so than anybody else. Yeah. I mean, you know, we do it once a month. If you want to do it bi-weekly, I mean, I'm, um, I think we can start with the once a month, and each month we try a different location, and then you know we can try that for a few months and see how it's going, and then yeah. if we want to add to that rotation, we have a lot of subcommittees or <laughs> working groups. Mm -hmm. So I also want to make sure that we don't overextend ourselves. So I'd rather. Sort of start well, I only have 13, so it's. Yeah. There's 15 in them. There's 15. <laughs> I've got 14. You're right. So, um, so, so I think. Once a month in various locations, non like. Not at Town Hall like, on Tuesday at 6 30. Yeah. Places that serve coffee or something. So, not Town Hall at 6 So, not. In, so, sort of removing the, that. Okay. We, we could have it in the rotation. Um, but, you know, maybe mm -hmm. we do coffee in different coffee shops yep. on a Saturday morning. Yep. Um, and, I, I, you know, there's any number of options that we could have. It's just a matter of making it, if we want to make that official. Yeah. So. Sandwich with a select board. This coffee, this coffee with a cop. Right. You know, sandwich with a select board. <laughs> It looks like the deadline for Friends and Family Day registration was May 15th, but maybe they would, they would make an exception. I was going to say that they might, they me, might they be tied enough yes. to make an exception yes. for us. Um, would we be extended the deadline to the 31st? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Anyway. All right. Why don't we each take, a, take one, one a month somewhere? Yeah. Yeah. I think I mean, so I think we should add that. So you'd be surprised how many people actually use our agendas and, and notice the office mm -hmm. hours and, and they plan on this. So what I'd like to do, at least for the for the summer months, is to be able to include the next say two or three. So we can just take a moment to plan out what that might look like. Yeah, we sure. also circulate a lot of publications that have office hours, so it's very helpful. Yeah. Eight thousand homes get. Um, so if we look at Let's see. 
So we're looking at our calendars. We're looking at our calendars and we're looking at pages five and six of the PDF. It does not have to be the day you meet at night. It could be any day. Right. Yeah. So five and six of our packet. Yeah, starting on page five. So for the let's take a look. The next oh that's why. So the next office hours are ends in on June fourth. Mm -hmm. So why don't we remove that? Okay. Um okay. and um, and since we can keep the individuals who are slated and just change the location. Sure. So, okay. So, I. So, do you have a. So, what should do you want to do in June? Or, but, I, but not for necessarily 6 30 on, on Tuesday. Yeah. I mean, you could do it on a Saturday. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all sort of a bit of an experiment mm -hmm. at this point to see if we. I put a Mark's house. He does host a nice pool party. Um, I could. I know that June eighth is very. My June eighth calendar is very full with Reading three seventy five. I could just ask the board not change uh -huh. June fourth because that's already been advertised. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's fine. Well, I'll start. keep it then. So let's move on to July then. Why don't we? Since Mark's not here, I don't want to volunteer him. Um, John, would you like to take us? Senior Center. Yeah, I think the thing to do July. is I'll communicate with um, yeah, with, Jane. with Jane Burns okay. and say, what's the best day? I mean, I'm guessing it's going to be a Wednesday in the middle of the day. Yep. Um, and, okay. you know, and whether I, and I, we could just pick a day and I'll do it every month. And that'll be one of them. See, I really think if we want this to be effective and outreach to the community is you, you begin with a specific day at a specific place by a specific person. And if each of us agree that we're going to do this once a month, you know, mm. there'll be one week when two of them are going on. But other than that, there'll always be every single week mm -hmm. you could find a person who's a member of this board mm -hmm. at their regular location, mm -hmm. you know? I think there's also th something to be said for shifting who is in attendance because otherwise there are five of us. Yeah. And if there's only one person who attends sporting events and one person who goes to the library and one person who goes to the senior center, then it doesn't give residents the exposure to all of us. Right. I think we should. it should be rotated like it's always been. Yeah. Um, That's just tough during the day. Yeah, so, but, but when John, you know, it's John's turn, he could do during the day. And one of us could do an evening or one of us. It won't be there at the Senior Center. Pleasant Street Center. They're not going to be there. No, no, no. One, you no, know, this would be, we're talking about different locations, John. So, so your location could be the Senior Center during the day, which would give access to a certain part of the population. I could do something on a, maybe a Saturday morning, which is time when other people are available to meet. Um, somebody could do a sportings event. Sport, you know what I mean? I think one of the things that I want to be cautious of too is that you know it's wonderful that you're retired and available during the day, but whatever you precedent think so, huh? we set, <laughs> yes, I, but whatever I, precedent we set here, um, will set expectations for future boards beyond us. So if we set an expectation that we are always available every month at the senior center, um, that may not be possible for future boards. So some years down the line. So I, I want to be careful about how we implement any change so that residents know what to expect um, and that we don't overextend ourselves as a board. I do think it would be nice to have someone at the senior center. I actually think it's a fabulous I mean, center. between five people, I do yeah. too. Let's assume, I may be retired, but I am not in a rocking chair, trust me. Um, you know, I've been on more planes in the last two weeks than, you know, you could imagine. I'm on the move. So, um, retired doesn't equal, you know, nothing to do. Um, I would say that, you know, with five of us, if once a month we were going to be at the senior center, you right. could work around. Right, right. You know, um, maybe it's a day somebody's working from home and they eat lunch there. So, Bob, you had a question? I just think if the board is going to start setting expectations, you want to go slow. Uh, I think monthly is a big ask. It might work, but if you start quarterly, you'll find out. Oh, I like the idea of quarterly. It's a way of sort of working it in slowly. Quarterly in each location? I think so. Yeah. Pick, I don't know how many locations, at least three. Town Hall, Library, Senior Center just come to mind. <coughs> 
But, but I thought the concept was to try to go where the people are. I mean, that's my idea. This, I, I like know, that idea. It's um, it's not it's not really hammered in stone. It's just, yeah. Uh, I mean, the advantage of that is that you know there there are certain groups that go to the senior center, as John was pointing out. There's certain groups that go for Saturday morning coffee. You see them all over town. Yeah. There are certain groups that go to the library. So um, why don't we looking at the. Um, agenda here. So we're going to keep June 4th. Mm -hmm. I think July, we have Mark, but has that been published anywhere for July, Bob? Um, it's here, probably. How far out do you publicize? Three, four months. That's a lot. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's keep you know Mark what then. up to? Um, I don't know if she's done the third quarter. So let's incorporate a different. She asked me for was. Is there anything wrong with leaving one here every yeah. month? No. So you could just leave it. Le leave the ones that are leave there. Leave the ones that have been that have been that are in here now that okay. are in the packet. So so great. So for July, John, did you want to schedule one then for the senior center for sure. July? All right, great. So at our next meeting, can you report in on what day? I'll talk to be? Jane and find out what day of the month, what time of the month is best. Fabulous. So and can you also report into Bob so he can add it to this to the packet for next? Absolutely. Week? Fabulous. I'm confused. Are we uh, keeping? The office hours here, yes. um, they do get changed from time to time, so I don't know how carved in the stone they are. Occasionally, and I mean, it comes to them anyway, so um, I but don't I, I Actually, think that's not true. We had one. I, we, we have, I, have I, I shouldn't say nobody, but, but it's. They're sparsely attended. They're sparsely it, yeah. attended. So I think what we can do is, given that we're in, we're at the end of May, maybe we keep June and July and then maybe drop off in August and August is the one we change okay uh, I would so I'm scheduled for the August one yes um, can that be any because the, uh, the first week in August it can be any time in be August any time in August Just pick a date awesome okay. so why don't you pick that find the location and then you can hand that off to Bob as well and he can include that okay in the, in the next packet Okay. Because if these get publicized three months out, I want to start getting ahead of these. And then September is John. Maybe we can. Maybe that can be a sports event. Um, all right. So. Bulldog game. <laughs> September. You done by then? Well, we're done. We're all right. Done by then. Um, and the other thing is, as far as getting a table, Bob, is that something at um, friends and family? Bob, is that something we could ask of you? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And then is. Uh, friends and family is so the eighth. Sixteenth, I think. Fifteenth, no, maybe. Fifteenth, I believe. Fifteenth, yeah. Okay. Um, so if everyone is available and could mark their calendars for the fifteenth, so we could man that booth. Um. You know, we don't have to say now, but just right. something to be aware of. I'm sorry, what's the date again? I was fifteenth. Double checking. Yeah. June fifteenth. Yep. June fifteenth. Hey. I'll add that to my calendar as well. Okay. So, I think we're in good shape there, unless anybody else wants to further that discussion. Okay. So, next up is future agendas. So, we've already touched a little bit on this for the June 4th agenda, which is our next meeting. We have the fiscal year 20 election cycle. We'll be appointing members to boards and committees. Now, Bob and Caitlin, my question for you is, will we have wrapped up all interviews in time to make a recommendation at the June 4th, or do we need to split it into two? I think right now we look like we're in good shape to finish up before your first June meeting. Okay. Um, we are still waiting on a few to hear back from a few people, but for the most part, I think you should be good. Okay, so let's keep that. We can, for the June 25th agenda, we can keep that appoint boards, committees, and yep. commission just as a holding spot in case we need it, but we can always take that off. Um, and then the other thing that I noted down just as we were talking tonight is um, the role of liaisons has come up. Mm -hmm. We may need to discuss offline sort of what that conversation is going to look like. Bob, yep. you may have input there. Okay. Um, we can also add the onboarding brainstorm. 
um, and we'll revisit the charter discussion regarding non-residents once Bob you're able to get information further information on that this is June 4th June 4th and is there anything else Bob that we anticipate that isn't already listed because this is a pretty light agenda no I've listed oh. some things at the very back that don't really have a date okay. one, of them, have a one of them is um, PTTF um, Will they be ready in early well, June? I suggested a schedule that June wouldn't fit, that, that the last one would have. Generally speaking, Reading is very quiet during the summer. Mm -hmm. So P PTTF issues normally are just before the summer, just as the fall starts, and then in the middle of the winter, it makes logical sense to me. Um, this It may be different now because there's a couple of issues that are just not calendar sensitive, like April Street. Mm -hmm. um, I'll have a much better idea tomorrow. I, I would say definitely not for June 4th, but maybe for the second June meeting. Does Ann, do, do Ann and I want to give an update on the ad hoc uh, committee at that point? I mean, we're supposed to... As a liaison report, or... But I think I just uh, well, so, you know, we're not liaisons. We're part of the um, ad hoc committee. So I see. Do we need a separate agenda item for that? Why don't you two discuss, and you can just let me know how okay. you want to handle that. Yeah. Maybe you can do that following the meeting. That's a good idea. Yeah? Okay. John, did you have? I did. It just slipped away from me for oh. a second. I'll go back though. Um, so um, just lost it. So I'll shift to Bob then. Bob, you said there's um, a couple oh, of items here. The land purchases, but we're not ready for that yet, you said? Tonscom wanted to discuss how to approach it, so yeah, they're not on that. Um, the second water meter discussion, is that something that Jane would be able to? Um, I think she plans to do that in July. Oh no, it's not listed, but it could be July. She's coming in to um, discuss her uh, DPW policies as well as a waste zero recycling idea that she has. Okay. So it could be added to that. Um, there was actually something, um, Dan, if you're still watching, this one's for you. <laughs> um, he had recommended on his last meeting when we reviewed and made changes to the select board policy that we look at final draft version of it because we made a lot of changes and approved that one because we also have to have a public oh, okay. hearing for that. Oh. So for the, uh, I think you filled the legal requirements for articles one and two. Have we? Okay. Yeah, other than there's more work to be done in some of the sections like communication. Right. So why don't we? Uh, it's certainly, your policy should be on the website right now. It is okay. the correct one. So I think. He did rec I, I'd like to sort of honor Dan's recommendation that we do a second, do a last pass review on it. Um, so Bob, if you could include that in the June 4th. Um, I can't, because I think you need to post two weeks hearing notice. I'll check. Okay. If we need a two week hearing notice, then we can push it to the 25th. If we yeah. don't need the two week hearing notice, then let's put it on the 4th. And you want to do both articles one and two? Were those the ones we reviewed yeah. at the last minute? Okay, then yes, please. So I have something that is not, I don't think we've discussed it, but I've suggested it to the PTTF really as a question uh, as to how hard enforced it would be. But I, I think we need to, now that we've had a chance to look at um, the parking sticker thing for a while, um, I think that I see a couple of flaws in the way that we finalized it that I think we could revisit. Um, I think the compost thing worked fine. Um, I, the idea of the dollar amount um, matched up really fine, but we missed it, I think, on um, when people have multiple cars. I think the, the idea of a placard, you know, kind of a, that hangs off the, the mirror. And I, I talked with um, um, Lieutenant Amendola about this, about, you know, how hard would this be to enforce? I was talking to Mike Scooten, you know, the safety officer, and both of them seemed to think that, and Bob, I, I think they might have even brought it up. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, we talked about it, yeah. And, and, and so my thinking is that, obviously, it's we have what we have this year, but we start to think about ordering stickers and all that stuff in the fall. Um, and I think there are, I mean, if you, if a family buys a sticker 
and it has three registrations printed on it. There is extra cost involved in creating that, but and there's but there's no change in enforcement, and you can only use it in one car at a time. So, so I, that's a know. great idea, John. Bob, is that something that we could put together for June fourth? Yeah. Uh, no. Is that a little tight? Yeah, yeah that's okay. probably too too tight. Is the June twenty fifth more reasonable? I don't think so. July. Think uh, July is pretty full. It could work time wise, but I think it's pretty full. I think it's a decision that probably needs to be made by let's say September. So August. Will that give us enough okay. time, Bob? I'll talk to Dave. Because I seem, as I remember, when we initially did this, we had to get it done by September because right. of the way that they we order. ordered stickers and all that. Right. And so we actually missed the whole year. Yeah. Because we were dragging our feet one time. Yeah. This is a thing that I think. I, I just think nobody intended to have somebody have to go buy two or three stickers yeah. um, when they were only going to use one car down there at a time. Yeah. I mean, so Bob, can you? So there's, there's other related issues that you should also discuss if you're going to discuss that. Um, so I'll just be brief and say one of them is a past board and a past town manager wanted to be incredibly precise and narrow on what the qualifications were to get a sticker. So it had to be run through the DMV. It, it was complex. Um, I'm not quite so interested in all those yeah. rules. I don't think this board is either. But just so you know, there's other related issues that should be discussed at the same time. Uh, procedurally. Okay. So is that, do you want to take a look and talk to yeah, Dave and see when I'll that works? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, could we, when, when we have that discussion, could we get the numbers yeah. of, of um, stickers sold before we did the price hike mm -hmm. and after? Yeah. Great. That's a great suggestion. All right. So now we're on to minutes. Um, do, John, do you have a motion? I do. Um, move that the board approves the meeting minutes of May 7th, 2019, as presented and amended. Is there a second? Second. Um, any edits? What page are these things on again? They start on page 38, on 38, 38 of the PDF. 38. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I had a couple of minor ones. Um, had to do with um, we all weighed in on you Vanessa at, towards the end of the some point in the meeting you asked what kind of meeting structure discussion um, mm -hmm. did everybody want and I think Mark um, said something as well I just don't know what he said he's not here um, because I think we all had input I, so, but I, I, I don't know what he said, so. Um, I don't know if that's important to, to the board to be that uh, all encompassing or not. But I, did, I did notice that. I have no edits to this one. I have none. Oh. Though is spelled incorrectly at some point. Okay. T H O. Oh. And um, it's T. It's probably from your shorthand. Did you bring all those on? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um. Though. Though. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That should. Um. If I open the document, that should yeah, come up as yeah. spelled wrong. Yeah. So. That's a. Uh, <laughs> So before we jump to that, um, are there any other edits? Okay. Uh, we have a motion. We have a second. All those in favor? Great. Um, do we have a motion to adjourn? I have, oh, I, just to revisit the, uh, and I don't want to um, rehash this too much, but um, in thinking about our, 
uh, our next meeting's agenda item where we're going to revisit um, the question of what to bring to the uh, to the bylaw committee about the charter. Uh, I, I'm thinking it might be it might be just my own um, failure of imagination, but it might be helpful to have a list of those non our current non policy setting committees. Yeah. Um, to know like what what is the scope of what we would be asking them to look at That's and I, I recognize I'm we may sure in the future that, establish I'm not more. Sure what you have in mind. I can take a shot shot at it let's take a shot at it okay All right. I think it was it was hard to envision what this what what this was contemplating without without being able to well, think as an example oh. fincom is not regulatory and they are also not elected it's all asterisks. And we don't appoint them. Right, but we appoint. So technically they would, but. They could be, because they could it's be. in the charter. And but I don't think that was the. Yeah, but that wasn't really the motivation. So it, it wasn't. And I'll be honest, this wasn't, this was an idea. It mm -hmm. wasn't a, a. Proposal. Right, it, that was hammered out and I had mm -hmm. an exact vision. It was sort of a preliminary discussion to say, is this something. And I, and so well, there is that designated scope. How did that end? Huh? How did that discussion end? Are they, is the bylaw committee being requested? No, not yet. Not no, yet. Not yet. So okay. the, the agreement was that um, Andy and Ann would bring this up as part of their ad hoc right. okay. meeting yeah. next Got week. It. And then they sort of report back. No, and so no. I think it would be helpful for We'll a, talk about it on June 4th. Uh, yeah, and so I was saying it would be helpful on June 4th to understand what other I think I, I don't think we would want to go to ask. I don't think we would want to ask the bylaw committee. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, uh, but but to, I don't think we'd want to ask the bylaw committee to um, look into a change that would allow non-residents to serve on FinCom. I can't right now imagine a motivation for why we would okay. want to do that. Yeah. So I think we just. To, I think that's a really good point. Yeah, I think it would just be helpful Which to... Which ones would apply to? Right. Yeah. Are we going to have a public hearing before we go forward? Don't we want to hear from the public about this? So, the, the bylaw committee could have such a hearing. Yes, yeah, we're, we're not really there. You could also. There's no rule, rules that say you can't. Okay. I mean... We could certainly take... I mean, at this point, know. we don't have anything... A, a public hearing implies that we have something to change or report. Decide, at this yeah. point, we're born in exploratory phase. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So. I do think we need to hear from the public before we make any recommendations. I, I really feel strongly that yeah, that would I be important. I think that would be fine. Well, so. So, we'll, so we won't plan to necessarily vote on anything. We'll, we'll continue the conversation. Yeah, it's a conversation. We'll continue the conversation next, yeah. for next time. Okay. Okay. Um, any other comments? I just have a question. You know, sure. you had asked us about... Um, Vacation in when we're not going to be around, yeah. so I will Please not don't be say here. that out loud, though. Just tell me offline. Okay. Don't um, announce when your house is going to be empty. Yeah. My house is never empty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to be gone. <laughs> uh, 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 all right. Um, if there's nothing else, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Before you leave, there's something to sign.